Hello everyone, today I'm going to be teaching the basics of the c -sharp programming languages by making a console, a short, small console game. As you know, I like to play games and I program, and I'm going to combine the two to show, to make an interesting way to learn c -sharp, um, by making a game. We're going to start by hitting File, New, Project, and going and creating a console app.net core. And basically, we're going to name it our uh, RPG game. And we're going to create that game in, in our whatever repo we want to. OK. Now that we're here, uh, we have the uh, main function right here. And what this does is whenever you run the program, it's going to run whatever's inside main. This is built by the, uh, when you create a new tutorial, um, I mean a new project, the framework creates this just kind of as a base to start. This this part here, you don't don't delete this because this is the part that gets run. So in here, you can see console right, right line says hello world. So if I was to run the game by hitting the play at the top here, it's called RPG game because that's what I named this project. You will see that it's building and then the console pops up and then it closes. You can see out here the uh, Hello World gets printed out, and then when uh, the debugging stops, this disappears, just so it doesn't automatically close the window. So you can hit that, and then we continue. First, I'm going to go over variables. Variables are containers that hold data. So if we have a number variable called, let's say, uh, random number you can store five into random number and basically this is a container the whole data and programming is basically just storing and moving and manipulating data so uh, variables are going to be a huge part of things because it allows us to take in this like user input like like what is your name the variable could be name and it can now be David is the value so we're gonna we're gonna do variables first so to show this first I'm going to uh, Increase the size a little bit here so we, we can see it better on the screen. And then I'm going to type in here. So when you declare a variable, you type in the data type that it is. So in this case, I'm going to make it int variable, which is a number that doesn't have a decimal point. You give it the name of the variable. So I'm going to say random number and then a semicolon to end the line. So this basically right here, I have created a uh, variable called a random number that stores only integer values. The integer values are, uh, as I mentioned before, are numbers without a decimal. So if I wanted to assign this just immediately, I can put an equal sign here and say the number four. So now random number equals four. Now if I was to say 4.4, this would error. As you can see, a red line appears under it. If we put your mouse over it, it'll t tell you why. Or if you have the error list down in the bottom of the screen, which I believe I'm covering. So I'm gone here. You can see it says, can I cannot explicitly convert type double to int? I mean, I mean, this number right here is a double and not an int. So we're going to go uh, through the data types. And I'm going to give you examples of each. So for an int, we're just going to go um, with four. Now we're going to make a double. I'm going to call it random number two. Uh, you can't have variables with the same uh, name. So if I was to name this, it would error and say random number is already defined. You cannot redefine it. So I'm going to name it random number, number two. You also cannot start uh, variable names with a number. but you, And you can't have spaces. So if you want to do spaces, you can do underscores. Or you can do capital case, kind of like how I have it here, where random and then every part number that changes is capital. Uh, in that case, it will, will go. OK, so we got int and double. So now we've accomplished numbers and then decimal numbers. Character, which is just a single character, which is denoted by single quotes. And then inside there would be the character A. But you can't have two characters. It has to be a single character. Character is a single, single thing. There's a string. Uh, 
string, I guess what's wrong, which you could, let's say, it's the name, which is donated by double quotes, which is basically a bunch of characters strings together. So I can type in David. So it's the character D followed by the character A, etc., etc. You can put spaces in it, etc. You got bool, which is, let's say, result. And this is true or false. And basically, this is a flag that could say something true or something false. Uh, so you can, you know, um, is did hit enemy, true or false, something, something of that nature. A major one that is very complex is object. Um, my, we'll call it my object. And this object is the base class of all. Uh, objects that you could make. Now objects are a collection of properties that you could uh, classify as a single thing. So in this case we're going to eventually make it, uh, an object class called player which is this it's called player and it has all the properties of a player such as the player's health. The health is a number so the int. So the player has health which is an integer. So it's 100, you know, it can go down. If you wanted the player to have health, that could go to the points. You know, you would have the health be double, and then he could get hurt, and he can go down to 55.5 or something of that nature. Uh, but right now, these these are the main data types that you will most likely be using um, in their base forms. But objects, you will most likely be using other other uh, classes, uh, such as a program, console, system, etc. These right here will don't donate designate as green by the default color of uh, Visual Studio. So to start off with some basics of collecting a variable and storing it to kind of show you that in game form, what we're going to do is we're going to delete all this and we're going to start with put outputting something for the game. Now it's a good practice to always comment your code so you and the other programmers know what you're trying to do with it. If you hit two backslashes I believe they're backslashes, they could be forward slashes, but I think they're two backslashes, uh, allows you to put a comment in the code. So here, we're going to output the text stating that we want the player's name. So in this case, as you can see already down here, console.writeline uh, allows you to write lines to the console. So inside here, it takes, uh, the parameter it takes right here, you can see is a string of the value, and it writes the specified string value uh, to the output stream, which in this case is the console. So in here, we're going to say, what is your name? And we're going to say question mark. So now, you'll see if I only run this right now, and I'm going to hit the play button up here for RPG game, it's going to, the console app is going to say, what is your name? So we're going to now uh, console, which allows you to handle uh, functions like, like actions related to the console screen. If you hit period, you'll be able to see uh, options that you can use on console. So what we're going, we want to do is read the line. Whatever line we type in, we want to be able to read it. And then you can see that in here, it takes back a string. This will, this will be explained better uh, when we get into functions, but right now we're going to uh, just use console.readline and then in these parentheses uh, we put nothing and then semicolon. Now since this returns a string, we want to store that string into a variable. So we can create a string at the front and we're going to call this player's name. We're going to put a comma what we're doing. Store the player's name entered. So now, in this case, if we run the game, we're not going to see too much happen, but it says, what is your name? Now it is waiting for us to type in an input. If I type in David, then hit enter, now the program ends, which is what, why that text comes up. It took what I typed in David and stored it inside player's name, but I haven't done anything with it. So right now, I'm going to output it and say, let the player know his name. And here we're going to say console.writeline, which is what you saw before. And 
and we're going to say uh, thank you for entering your name and then this is going to be David. So this is what I want to come out on the screen with a period because we have to good punctuation, right? We're professional. So this, it's not always gonna be David. Anyone can enter whatever they want for their name. So at this point, this part has to be the player's name, which we stored inside this variable. Now this string, this is, can be combined by multiple sections. So what I mean by that is here, when I can end this string. So now the string is just going to be Thank you for entering your name, comma. It's going to be output to the screen. Now I'm going to end that string. I'm going to plus and add a variable being a uh, player's name. And then I'm going to plus and add another string being the period at the end. Because if you don't put the period, it's not going to output. So at this point, I'm saying thank you for entering your name. I'm ending that string because that's a hard string. Like this, this it doesn't have error, any variables in it. It's, it's hard coded. I'm ending that string. I'm appending to that string the player's name. So it's going to appear right at the end, right here. And then right after that, I'm entering a period. So here, we want to have a little bit of space just to make it look proper. If we had a space here, you can see, thank you for entering your name, space, player name, period. So if we run that, which what I, what I did right there, instead of hitting the play, I just hit F5 on my keyboard as a little shortcut to allow you to run. So now it says, what is your name? David. It says, thank you for entering your name, comma, space, David. And then the period. But because because I, I kept saying David, it's not necessarily that impressive. But we're going to put John. So now I put John. Thank you for entering your name, John. So now John, the variable was stored. We stored your name. And now I outputted it to the screen. So that is the basics of data types and variables. In the next video, we're going to be going, to be going over if statements to allow the player to choose an attack. We're going to say, you have encountered your, an enemy, and I want you to do, type in either one, two, three, or four, and then do an attack. And that's going to be in the next video. Thank you for watching. Welcome back for the next uh, segment of creating my RPG console game inside of C Sharp uh, Visual Studio programming language. And today we're going to be going over if statements and a little bit of looping. So here, where we left off, you ask the player what is his name, you read in the player's name, and then right now you thank uh, the player for uh, entering his name. Now we want to say that you've encountered an enemy in the field, you're just walking through, and you encountered an enemy, and we want to give you a list of items to a list of the things that you can do you, and then you type either one two three or four to do an attack let's say uh, defend with the shield things of that nature so we're going to say uh, right out to the screen about the enemy attack so what we're going to do here is we're going to do what we've been doing above which is writing out the line and we're going to say uh, I'm just going to say, just to make it personalized, we're going to say player's name. So in this case, David, space, you have encountered an enemy. Why do I feel like I spelled all that wrong? Uh, what would you like to do? And then here, I'm going to say one. Uh, single attack two multiple or not, I'm gonna go three three strike attack and I'm gonna say three because it looks better uh, next to the two uh, three uh, what should we do for three how about we just let's do five strike attack <laughs> Let's, let's defend. Defend, and then four is attempt to run away. We're going to do that. 
Now, I want to know what you chose. So just like before, when we, when we read, the, the, read the line right here, we're going to store what action the player chose. So here, string players action equals console.readline, whatever he wrote for that line. So if we run the program, which again, for those jumping into the second one, uh, second video here, I hit F5. Uh, you could also run the program here by hitting the play button here, but F5 is just a shortcut key to launch it. So you didn't see me click it because I hit F5. So what is your name? In this case, still David. It says, thank you for answering your name, David. David, you have encountered an enemy. Oh no, oh no. What would you like to do? Single attack, three strike attack, defend, or attempt to run away? Now, I'm just saying on the screen here, I don't necessarily like how this looks. I, I expect it, in, in my mind, to have it listed down. So how can we do that? Here, the strings, they have special escape characters you can do to specify that you want something on a new line. So in here, I'm going to do forward slash, then n, which, as you can see, turns a different color, is a special character. That means go take this string and put this the rest of the string on a new line. So I'm going to copy this just to kind of make it easier. I'm going to paste it in the beginning of each one of these numbers. So now when I run the program, you'll see that when I enter my name as David, it is now, now down lines and it looks better like, like you're trying to choose something here. And of, of that, um, on that note kind of, I want to do a little space after entering my name and I want to do two spaces before the attack. This, this isn't necessarily for any reason, it's just personal preference for me that I think it looks better if you have it spaced out a little like that. So you can see now, it says, thank you for entering your name, and then it's like space, and it's like, now we have started the game. David, you have encountered an enemy, what would you like to do? Oh, dun, 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 like the Pokemon. So I can enter a number. So in this case, I'm going to enter one for a single attack, and that's it, because that's all we programmed. So uh, here we have the player's action, which is one, and that is in, in the string. So now we're gonna be learning about if statements. We're going to check what action the player took. Now in this case, we, we, have, a, we have a branch. Four things could happen. Well, technically five things could happen. One, the player could type in one. Two, the player could type in two. Three, the player can type in three. And four, the player could type in four. And five, the player can type in something completely different, like David again. And that would not be valid because that we really want you to be able to choose one through five, one through four. So in this case, I'm gonna type in in this statement. When you say if, uh, you'll see here, it comes up with a code snippet for the if statement. And if you hit tab twice, it inserts the if statement. If I hit that, it automatically writes it for me and I don't have to worry about it. But if you were to write it yourself, which I prefer, I recommend doing it if, if tab tab method, if tab tab. As you can see, it wrote it completely for me. It's a lot faster, makes you more efficient. But if you just wanna get into it, just so you like know and like kind of learn, if you put two parentheses and then the beginning squiggly and then an end squiggly. And basically what's, what does an if statement do? It says run the code in between these two squigglies if the code that's in between these two parentheses comes out to be true, uh, it, true, it goes in there, and then false, it doesn't go in there. So you have to have Boolean logic inside of this uh, area at the top, where, uh, like in, in here. So you'll have to have Boolean logic inside these two parentheses in order to uh, come out with either true or false. Now, what, what is Boolean logic? Well, uh, we have a couple options. So I'm, at the moment, I'm gonna just do bools to kind of show what being either true or false. Now, Booleans can be true or false, so I'm just gonna cheat and just type in true or false. So if true, this if statement saying that if the result of this equation is true, which I'm saying it is true, because true, then I go in here and run this code. If it is false, then it does not go and run that code. So I can say, is this true 
or false. Now, if this is true or false, you're saying run this code if one of these things is true. If this is true or this is true. Well, this one's true, so you would run the code. If I want to say and, if the left part is true and the right part is true, then we run this code. Then this, we would not run the code here right now because if true and false, both are not true. So it would fail. Then now to kind of show that in uh, other other forms, you could, you could kind of say like does one equal equal. Now, if you remember, if I said one equals two, like that, it kind of thinks that it's it's assignment, it's assigning it, which you can see is the error message that comes up. The left hand of an assignment, uh, left hand of an assignment must be a variable property property or indexer. Now that that statement right there is because it thinks the left side is going to be a variable that you're storing the right part in. We're not doing that in this case. We want to compare if one equals two, so we put equals equals. So I'm saying now it does one equal two. This will always come out to false, so this code will inside the if statement will never run because one does not equal two. However, if I put an exclamation mark and it equals, this is saying does not equal. So does one not equal two? Yes, true. One does not equal two. So this comes out to be true. So then we run this code. Uh, you can also do greater than or equal. Is one greater than or equal to? Is one greater than two? In this case, it's false. Uh, same thing for the uh, greater than or equal. Is one less than two? Yes, true, I run the code. Is one greater than or equal, uh, greater than, I mean less than or equal to two? True, I will run the code because it's less than. Um, if I did something like this, two is less than or equal to two, that would also be true because it's equal. And then I could do something like and you know, three equals three. So is two less than or equal to two? Yes. And three equals three? Yes. So true and true is true. So we run the code. Um, but if I said and three does not equal three, this is false. So then this part is true. This part is false, so it's true and false, so that's not true and true, so it does not run the code. So basically, we can run a, bu a bunch of things of that nature. And if you want, you can group the results. So let's say if I said, if this and this, all this equals true, or four is greater than three. So it's like, is four greater than three? Yes. Or, Three, e three equals three, and two is less than or equal to two. True, it goes. Ba basically, you can just combine a bunch of stuff here and make it work. So here we have player's action, player's action. So we're gonna check if player's action equals, now this is a string, so we have to compare it to a string, and we're going to say one. If the player's action equals one, he typed in one and that's it, then we run this code. So here I'm going to say, uh, write out that we chose a t uh, one. So we're going to say console write line, and here we're going to say you chose to single attack. Exclamation point. It's very important. Okay. So right here, check that the player what action the player took, which is one, and then we we write that he attacked. So to show that. I'm going to say my name is David, and now what do you want to do? I'm going to choose one, and then hit enter, and it's like you chose the single attack, yay! If I do that again, I'm gonna just enter a random name. Now what did I choose? I'm gonna choose three, or three to defend, and you'll see nothing happened because I did not, player's action does not equal one, so this if statement right here, it went past. So now, we want to learn what do you want to do if the player's action is not one. Right now we're saying if if this part is true, then run the code inside here. Else run other code. So in this case, if player's action equals one, this else 
run other code. So here we could say, uh, you chose something else, which you'll see if players equal one, you run here else. If it is any single thing other, it runs this. So just to show that I'm going to do three again, there should be uh, defend and it says you chose something else. If I did four, if I did five, et cetera, et cetera, it's something else. So that, that's what would come out there. So in this case, I want to see if the player did one, two, three, or four, or something else. So I can actually do else if, and then do another if statements here. So I'm going to copy and paste this, and then I'm going to copy and paste these multiple times. So here, if the player does chose two, three, or four, and I'm going to write out, and I'm going to copy these parts. I'm going to pop these in here, and basically say what what they chose. So I'm going to say, let the user know he chose something else. Write out that we chose four, and then three, and then two. And then you chose to multi-attack which I think is what I named it. Then we're gonna go with you know, three strike attack, defend, and, and run away. You chose to three strike attack. You chose to defend, and then you chose to run away. All right, so if we check this out now, we can see that all our options are now chosen. So we're gonna choose David, and I'm going to First, I'm going to type in something that's random. You chose something else is what happens, because that's the elf case. It's when we ran all that other code, and it's nothing that we wanted. It was the elf case. But if I did three, you chose to defend. Two is the three strike attack. Four is to run away. And then we saw that so, one. So now we chose to attack. This, well, like in, in the future, basically what we're gonna we're gonna do is we're going to have the player attack, and he's gonna do a uh, random number, a certain amount of damage. So the enemy's gonna have 100 health. If you have an attack power of 10, you do attack, you get 10 damage. He now has 90 health left. If we go that route, What we're going to do is have the player attack. He's going to hit the enemy for, for 10 points. It's going to knock down the, the enemy uh, by 100, from 100 down 10 points. So he's going to have 90. So we have to give the player the ability to do something again. Now, if we give him the ability to do something again, we want to give him the same actions, right? So how are we going to get this all to come back again after, after we do this? Well, you can... Uh, Let's say copy and paste this whole entire part and put it here, and then here, and here, and here. And then as you can see, I now have uh, multiple parts, which are kind of erring here because I can't redefine player's action. So I can reuse the variable if I get rid of the name. So that would be how I fix those. But right now, what I did was I hard coded by, by typing this in, in this code. It will have to happen. I think I did it. I, I pasted it a set of, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, five times. You will have exactly five attacks. If you manage to kill him on the second attack, you're still attacking this guy three more times, but he's already dead because I hard coded it to be four, I mean, five times to happen. We don't want that to happen. And not only that, but if you decided now that I don't want option three to be defend, I have to change this defend and soar up to this defend. The code becomes unruly. You can't you can't have every single possible option in a game be written out like that. So what we're going to do instead is do loops that kind of show uh, a major part of programming. 
because you want to use you want to reuse your code as much as possible. You, if you're if you're writing duplicate code, there's probably something you're doing wrong that you can modify and change a little bit because you don't want to write duplicate code. If you write duplicate code, you can't maintain it, and while you're while you're starting out, it might be okay. But if you ever do any project, the if you do duplicate code and then the deeper you get in, you have to make a change or something happens, uh, parameters change, etc. You won't be able to make that change as easily. And then now you get stuck because you coded it weird from the beginning. Continue to repeat the code. So here, in this case, so if here, I want to write out here, what has happened right now is false. It will never read in the player's action because the tell them what they chose. So in this case, before. So if I was to just I like encounter my first enemy, enemy. I'm going to so it does not run. You do create not get a variable so to if track you want, if uh, the to first put an exclamation mark in front of a boolean. Dead. Say take whatever this is so and make it what the opposite value is. Is. I'm going to so say this is also is as you saw before. I said this is not equal dead. With the with the so sign is the is first enemy equal. dead uh, right now? The first mark. enemy is not dead. It is false. That excellent first enemy is not dead. Uh, shows use the opposite. So right so now, in this case, show we're going to say it. We're saying while. while. So this for this enemy is not for this portion dead. right here. Where I, I read the first line, enemy dead. I do all this. Like, well, is he not right here? Dead? I'm going to put okay. that. I guess the while. way I word it is a little so weird. So while, but we're is. saying like, is is this first enemy dead? Is again, like I like the opposite. Recommend that. while for most the enemy is not dead. Built in statements. We're going to type in while. So when the enemy does become dead, tab tab, and I'll write This is going to turn the true. But if you wanted to write it yourself, which will make this true. It's while. And, then the and while we're saying then this, the while parentheses has to be a boolean, and then squiggly squiggly. not true, which would be so the opposite of true, which is false. So then we would not run this, this anymore. Thing so we don't want to run this true. because the enemy's the dead. So is true. Uh, it kind of makes sense English-wise, but I'm so not sure if I named the variable check good to kind of show that. The variable naming is very true. important. It kind of helps you track things and make sure you can follow the code. But yeah, let me see if I can. Uh, if it is true, it'll still run. If you keep running this over and over, first enemy is dead. I think this is good. Is first enemy dead? So is it not the first enemy? While the first enemy is not dead, we're going to continue. I think it works. So I'm going to cut all of this code here. You know, right click and cut, which or you can do Control X, and I'm going to put that inside of this while loop. We're going to do control V for paste. So I'm going to say, while the first enemy is not dead, repeat the attack or the player cycle. Play a little cycle. So now, while the, the, the first enemy is not dead, uh, you can do this, will go on forever. And we can see here, since we never change, is the first enemy dead? It will never actually come up and get out of there. So here, David. So I'm going to say, up. Oh, it stopped immediately. While is first enemy dead? Oh, because I I I changed it. I changed it to true before. Uh, in my example, it should be false. So now, we're, now we're good. We're good again. We're back. Okay. What is your name? David. So I'm going to say do a single attack, as you chose the single attack. Uh, now I get get to choose again. So I'm going to do three, uh, you know, three strike attack. And then I'm just going to. You can see it's going to go on forever until the enemy is dead. It's going to keep repeating. But since I'm not, I never change it, it's going to go on forever. So just to kind of show how it, it'll be if it stops, I can make another if statement here that if uh, player's action equals equals, I'm going to say kill just to be cheating, I can say is the first enemy player dead equals true. Then you'll see that I can attack, 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 attack. The moment I say kill, he dies. Because I left the while loop and now the code continues. 
So this includes uh, this segment of the game where we learned if statements and uh, while loops. The while loops allow you to continue code while something is true. Like keep running this while this is true. And the if statements allow you to branch your code like if this is true, do this, else do this. Or if this is true, else if this is true, else if this is true, else, and then can you kind of continue that way. So this allows you to branch your code so it isn't always doing one thing when the code executes from top to bottom. Next time we're going to be learning how to do objects and we're going to create uh, objects and classes and we're going to create a uh, player class and an enemy class and what this uh, allows us to do is create a player to track the player's health and what attacks he can do etc and the enemy and his health and I'll show you how inheritance works between enemies and the boss character. Uh, so thank you for watching I'll see you in the next video. Welcome to the third video in this uh, series of learning C Sharp programming. In this uh, video, we're going to talk about classes, uh, objects, and inheritance. Uh, we're going to create a player class, an enemy class, and a boss character class, and show how these classes can interact and represent the uh, entities that we want in our game. In this case, we have a player, and an enemy, and a boss character. Um, so first, what we're going to do, from where we're leaving off before, where we discussed while and if, if loops, we're going to right-click on our uh, RPG game project and we're going to add a new class which is on the bottom. We can say new item and then select class but it's a shortcut here for class. So we're going to name this class player. It's a good um, practice to have every single class that you have in C Sharp be a separate file. So you can see here the program class which you can see is denoted by class program is inside its program class and now we're going to have player it being its own player class. So here we have uh, the, the player class, which is right here. Uh, as I mentioned in a couple of uh, videos before, it's always good practice to comment your code. And it's, it's going to be helpful if you comment your code because then you can, you can help other people if you're working in a team or you can help remind yourself what certain items do. And to kind of show an example of that, uh, I'll, I'll show that later, but in this case, you know how you comment a code with uh, the, the two backslashes and then you can type in stuff. Well in this case I'm going to type in three backslashes and then it automatically comes out with a, a, a it's called like a, a comment a comment tab I think or something of that nature where you can type in it, it writes out like summary etc and I can write what this class is and it'll work with our uh, autocomplete. So here I'm going to say this class represents the playable Character. Web presents. It looks a little weird. All right. So we have our class player, uh, which this 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 syntax was automatically created when we created a new player class. However, I would like to point out that just that this to make a class, you say the class, you name the class, and then you put parentheses. Uh, and then what's inside the parentheses is what's defined inside the class. Now, if we want this class to be accessible outside of this namespace, RPG game. We put public, so this so other other code pieces in different namespaces can access this class. If we make it private, then this class is only available to uh, a namespace. But by default, it's private by not typing anything, and then that was erroring and saying that. But classes by default, you leave it. You don't. You don't sp specifically declare it as private. I uh, right. Right in this case, I want the the, the public class. I want the class uh, player to be public because I want other other code to be able to access our, our player. Now, once you're you're here, you have the ability to add uh, properties inside the player to determine what he he has. So, in this case, these uh, properties can be either public or private, like I mentioned before. So if I make a public class, uh, a public public property, and I want it to be an integer, and I want it to be his health, I can, I can do that. Now, in this case, we need to have the ability to get the health, the player's health. And if we get the player's health, we have to return the health.
I'm, I'm kind of showing this a little, a little complicated, and then I'm going to like cheat a little here. But you you have to create a, a, a private variable to hold the health. Then the public variable is what can be used to get the health, and what that's going to return is the private variable. And then when you set, you're going to be setting the private variable to the value. So this is what a property looks like. For every, every single time you want to get the player's health, like or you can create a new property, this is what you have to type in. Now this is kind of like boiler, boiler plate, plate code is what people call it. We always have to type in like, oh, I always have to type in the same thing, and it's always the same, unless I want to do something crazy. So in, in this case, there's actually some a little neat little trick you can do to avoid typing all this, because who wants to remember this? This, you know, uh, this is too hard. So if we're gonna erase all that, I'm going to type in prop for a property, and then we're gonna hit tab, tab, and then basically what this is going to do, you can hit tab to swip, switch between the two areas here. So I wanna make an int, and I want this to be my health. Now with this squiggly here, by just saying get inside here and then set, it automatically creates the getter and the setter the exact way I wrote it, but you don't have to see it, you don't have to type it, you don't have to know about it. I created health and now I don't have to worry about uh, any, anything else with it working. I can easily just create like, let's say, mana, if I want it's mana there, but uh, we're, we're not gonna worry about that. Right now we're just worrying out the, about the player's health. So now we have a player class, which when created, he has the health. He has health. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, for autocomplete purposes and for good practice, you would want to document when health is. So I'm going to put the three, the three comments here because the property can be uh, labeled specially. I'm going to say this represents the player's health values. Okay. Now, when a uh, a class is created, it has to be instantiated. So a class, there can be one player, or there can be multiple players. And if you have, you have one definition of what a player can be, but you can make two, or three, or four, or five. So what that's called is in instantiating. When you instantiate a class, you make it so, you create a copy of that class in its own single person, he lives by itself. So if I instantiated David, now David exists as a player. Instantiate John, now John exists as a player. So at this point, uh, I want you to demonstrate making the player. So in our main uh, program here that we have, uh, at the very beginning, before I even type in a name, I'm going to create the player character. So create the player character. In this case, I'm going to type in player. Now, as before, I mentioned that I was gonna show that here when you type in player, as you can see in the autocomplete menu, we have this class, which is don donated by this symbol here. This class represents this class represents a playable character. This this text right there is the text I wrote right here. So now, if you wanted to put something else that somebody when they put their mouse over it, like it actually has text here that can help people and help you remember what it is. If you didn't put that there, like I'm just gonna delete this real fast. It just says player, and you're like. What's a player? <laughs> so it's always good to document your code. And then again, uh, here, I'll show for the health uh, when that comes out. But here, I, I named player, which is capital player is the class, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna name this variable that stores player as a lowercase. So it is case sensitive. You can't have uh, the player be called player as capital P, but player can be lowercase player. And then when you instantiate a new class, uh, you have to use the word new because you're creating a copy of it in memory. So new player, and then parentheses, parentheses, uh, there you go. So basically, we're gonna store into this vari uh, variable player a new instantiated class of type player and then, and then construct it uh, with the, which is what parentheses parentheses means. You're writing the constructor on here. Like you're creating a new class to store in the player object here. Now, what exactly does this part do? What, what does it mean when you're, const you're calling the constructor to run the class? Well, if we go over here, 
and we create a constructor. The constructor is uh, a function that has the same name as the class. You can see this is player player with the parentheses parentheses. Like you recognize here is what you see here. And then what the code that runs in here gets run when you create a, a new class. Now, by default, nothing happens. It creates a new class and nothing, nothing happens. So this right here does nothing. So if I don't say it in here, it automatically exists and does nothing. That's why this code is not erring because it exists and does nothing. But I want it to do something in my case. So I'm going to make the constructor and I'm going to make it do something inside of it. Now, as you saw what I did earlier, I know that if I type in CTOR, which stands for uh, the code snippet for constructor, if I hit tab twice, it writes it for me. You're gonna find there's a lot of things in C Sharp that if you don't have to like memorize everything, like I know like sometimes in school it'll be like, hey, you know, you can't use a calculator or something like that, or you have to memorize this and write it all by hand. When you get into the real world with good IDEs, which is what Visual Studio is, the code will kind of write itself for you. You just kind of have to know the concepts. I want to make a constructor. How do I make a constructor? I don't remember. I just type in CTOR and then boom, it wrote it for me. Like, I mean, you know, it's good to know it, but you don't have to like, it gets to a point where you're not necessarily thinking like, what do I have to type? You're just thinking about what do I want to do? And then you do it, uh, which is nice, which is why I, I'm a big fan of C Sharp and, and Visual Studio uh, in general. But anyway, I'm gonna put uh, you know some uh, comments here saying that this is the default constructor, and basically what I want to do here is set the health value to 100. So here I'm going to set health to 100. So basically, when this when I create a new player, it's going to call the constructor, and in the constructor I'm automatically setting his health to 100 because I want I want our player to have 100 health right from the start because when you create a int variable, the default value is zero. So because it's not specified, health equals zero, and you know we won't we don't want him to be dead whenever we start. So health equals 100. So the player has health and equals 100. And then we're just going to give him one more property here, uh, and that's going to be a string property. I can't type string, and it's going to be a name. The name of the player. So right now the player has two properties. A player has health and he has a name. I'm not going to set the name here because I don't know what the name is. So I'm not going to make a name come up every single time. I mean, I could, I could, could make it be like unknown name or something. So by default he has a name, but in this case I'm not, I'm not going to bother. Um, so in program here. We're going to now use those use those items. So here I created a playable character and stored it as player. So as before, you saw I said what is your name, and I stored it inside player's name. I'm not going to store it inside a local variable to this main function player's name. I'm going to store it inside the player. So basically, I'm going to take player. I'm going to hit dot next to him. So classes. If you hit dot after the the variable that has the class, it'll give you the the properties and functions that are available to this class. So in this case, based off of these wrench, I guess, the thing uh, represents a property. So we have two properties, health and name. In this case, I'm taking name, and I'm making the player's name equal console read line. And as, as I mentioned before, if you put your mouse over it, the name of the player, you know, that's what I has had as, as the, the function title. So autocomplete works for you here, which is very nice, because like I said, you, you want the guy to eat to work for you. So now we stored the player name. So now every place that has player's name before is going to error because I just removed it. Player's name does now not exist. So I'm going to copy this with Control C, and I'm going to pay, replace it with player name. And then the code now works exactly the same, except now player's name isn't stored inside the player's uh, the player class. Now, alternatively, what we could do here is instead of creating the player character this way, we could create the player character after the name here. And I'm going to say, uh, 
create the play player character and get and store his name. And in which case, I'm going to do print the squiggly lines and then squiggly brackets. And then in here, we're saying that after you create a player, set the initial values past the constructor. So the constructor runs and health is set to 100. But after that, set the values uh, here to whatever you want it to be. So if I hit control space, which does autocomplete, so I'm hitting control on my keyboard and then space, it brings up the autocomplete of the options I have to choose. I'm going to choose name and I'm going to set it to console.readline. So this is if you want to like be, uh, you, don't, you don't put semicolons inside there. Uh, this, this is if you want to be fancy and do it like a one line. And, and over time, this, this is kind of the better way to do it, depending on wor where code works. But there is literally no negative to doing it the first way I showed or this way. They're, they're both, they both work, and they both take the same amount of processing power, and et cetera. It's, it shouldn't, it's not going to affect things. But I'm going I'm to just leave it like this because I typed it. So the rest of the code is going to work. So now uh, we got the player's name and we got the player's health. So what we're going to do now is we're going to right-click RPG game, and I'm going to add another class, and we're going to call this enemy. Now what this class is going to be, uh, it's going to represent the base elements of an enemy. So here I'm going to be stating what properties an enemy has in this game. So in this game, uh, the enemy also is going to have health. Oops, prop, tab, tab, and he has health. And I mean, an enemy can also have, a, I guess, a name as well. Right now, he seems pretty, pretty similar to the uh, to the player character. But I can't really, at the moment, I can't really think of anything else to, to give an enemy. But I'm going to then the same thing as before. I'm going to create a constructor, call it the default constructor, and set set the enemies. <laughs> I don't really know how to spell that. We're just going to ignore that spelling part. But we're going to go health equals 100. So the enemy's health is 100. So now we got uh, an enemy. And any setup. Now I'm going to right click here. I'm going to create a new new class as well. And we're going to call this guy boss. And he's boss because he's the boss enemy. He's the boss. He's the bad guy. You have to, you have to fight him afterwards. So we got a, cl a class boss. Uh, represents the boss enemy in the game. So here, what does a, a boss have? Well, as, as we know, a boss uh, has health, and the boss has a name. Uh, and uh, just, just so you know, uh, here, string is, 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 a, is, is technically a class. So it has a capital S, and it, has, it, it shows up in green. But because string is so used in the language, Visual Studio uh, kind of made it like a default data type in, in the lowercase form. Both of them are valid. You can say lowercase string or capital string. No other class is like that except string. And I prefer to write string as in capital. But that's kind of like an old school thing because I learned it back when it was capital. I'm, I'm, I'm erasing it to write it in lowercase so you guys can see that. But just so you know, either way works. Like. You know, I'm, out, of, out of habit, I type it like this. Not like that. <laughs> I type it like this. But you guys, whatever whatever way you guys get decide to do for string, it's good. The only thing you want to make sure is that if you're working in a team, that you find out what your group is writing, and you all write it the same. You don't want, let's say, David to write it in capital S, and then John to write it in lowercase s. Then, then you just ruin the code base. It becomes unreadable. It's unmaintainable. It's gross. Ugh. 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 Okay. So boss here has health and a name. 
In this particular case, I'm just duplicating code. It, what, what makes the boss different from the enemy? Right now, he has health and a name. He's, he's the exact same thing. A boss is like an enemy. A boss, like you can use the word is, like a boss is an enemy. The boss is not a player, but the boss is an enemy. So the boss has everything an enemy has, but he have, might have more. Another example is kind of like cars can have tires. If you have a tire class, a tire can't be a car, but a car has tires. And a tire doesn't really have a car. It depends on how you word it, but a car has tires. So a tire can't be a car, but a car can have tires. And when you get into cases like this, you can use inheritance. And now to represent inheritance, you get public class boss, you put after here a colon, I did too much, a colon, and then you can type in the other class name. So here we're saying boss inherits everything from enemy. So this turns yellow, I mean I mean green, and it says hides an inherited member enemy health. So now that means that the enemy everything the enemy has, the boss already has. So he already has health and a name. So I don't need to specify this. Because a boss is an enemy, he already has health and a name. And because a boss is an enemy, when it's an enemy is created, it's going to give the boss 100 health. In this case, he's the boss. I don't want him to have 100 health. So in here, I'm going to make another constructor and call this the default constructor. And I'm going, by, by specifying constructor here, I overwrite the default constructor of of the enemy so by default enemy would have ran and I'm saying overwrite this and don't set his health to be a hundred set the health to be a higher value so here the health is 150 because he's a boss like a boss all right also because I'm defining these characters in here I'm going to, to name them here so set up boss name boss name boss I don't know how to spell boss all badass boss name <laughs> boss okay so name and uh, we're gonna go we're gonna go metal gear fashion here and this is big boss <laughs> so big boss is the name of the boss and the enemy in this case I don't really want to specify enemy because he's a base class because then that would imply that boss's name is, is, yeah, is enemy. For the enemy's name, we're going to do things a little different. The enemy class should not really have names set in the constructor because the, if the enemy is a base class, if this is an enemy, the boss is an enemy, blah, 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 they all have different names. If I put the bosses here as like uh, evil chicken or something of that nature, uh, then every enemy, even the boss, is going to be evil chicken from the start. So we want to make it so the enemy's name is set by the caller, so the program, but the I want to force it to be given at the start because you might forget a given name and then that's not good. So if I want to force a value, I can put, put it inside the constructor uh, the ability to input that value. So in this case, I'm going to say that I want you to input this string name into uh, the enemy uh, here and then the use that. So now I'm going to set the enemy name. So capital name equals lowercase name which is passed in. This this name that is passed in is now set to the name that's in the property of my class. And by doing this I'm I'm allow I'm forcing you when you create the enemy to give me a name and then I store that name and that's the name now of my enemy to be used. Now this this thin part here, the default constructor, I added a parameter here. So if I delete all this, I could either add it in manually, but I like to delete it all and hit the three backslashes, and you'll see it makes a parameter for the name. So if I put back the default constructor and here I say the the name we want to give to this enemy. I can specify what parameter I want to uh, the value like what, what the what the parameter is supposed to be. Like name is supposed to be the enemy's name. 
Uh, so I can say that there. So now we can see that by doing this, we have an error in the bottom. So if we go over here to the boss, you'll see boss, the enemy uh, constructor is forcing you to put in a name, and I am not doing that here. In which case, I don't, I don't have to set it up here with name. I can get rid of this. And I'm going to specify after this constructor, I want to say that the base class, which in this case is enemy, you run his base constructor, which you'll you'll see uh, when I type in this parentheses, it'll tell you the base constructor of enemy is name, and here name, the name we want to give to the enemy. This is the part that I put wrote inside the comment. So we're going to give the name big boss. So in that case now, now that we have made these classes, um, before, um, okay, and also right here, is first enemy dead? We're just gonna we're just gonna say is dead. So we're gonna go to the enemy here, and we're gonna say enemies have a property boolean is dead, and then we say like determines if this enemy is dead. The name of the enemy, the health value of the enemy. All right, and then just because I prefer to have spaces here. Uh, I put that. So now, here, instead of creating a variable like is enemy dead, by default it's false. Booleans by default are false. So here I'm going to create a variable to track the first enemy. So I'm going to create an enemy. I'm going to call him. Um, it's it's an enemy. It's a giant enemy crab. So it's a giant enemy <laughs> crab. Gamers. You know this, right? Old gamers. Okay, boomer, right? So giant enemy crab. Uh, so we create the new enemy class, and then we end it. But as I said before, I want to force the name. You can't just, you just can't create an enemy like this. You have to give me a name. Uh, so if I put my eyes over here, it says there's, you have to give name inside the parentheses. So here you can see that if I, type in the first parentheses, it autocomplete comes up and says, hey, what do you want to add? The name we want to give to the enemy. So that's the part I type. So we have to give a name, and we're going to call this giant enemy crab. And that's the, the enemy crab's name. Enemy crab here has 100 health as well. OK, so here it's player.name. You have encountered an, I'm going to say A here. And I'm, instead of saying enemy, I'm going to end this. And I'm going to append it as to the string before the giant enemy crab dot name. So whatever we change the name, we don't have to remember to change it here, but whatever we change the name here will automatically go here. So we're going to say, you have encountered a giant enemy crab. What would you like to do? So actually, we should name this first enemy. Because that, that would make more sense in the fact that it can be changed. It doesn't have to be a giant enemy crab. Because right now, first enemy, if I do it that way, I can say this is giant, giant enemy bat, and it will work here, and it will make sense English-wise on, on the name. But we're going to keep the crap, because I want a giant enemy crab. What you like to do is so we tell, you know, we say what do you want to do. And here, uh, we're saying while the first enemy is not dead, repeat the playable cycle. So now we're saying while the first enemy is dead, is it dead? If it's not dead, we continue. So we're continuing. So now we have literally right now have not changed the code at all, but we have made it have classes now. So now we have a playable class, a player class that has health, and an enemy class who also an enemy class who also has health. And a boss. We haven't got to the boss fight, fight, fight yet. Like, phew, you know. Okay, so here uh, I'm just going to change the console right line here a little bit. You have encountered a giant enemy crab. Uh, what would you like to do? I'm going to take this part. Oops. And then I'm just going to write that out inside the while loop because it's going to make more sense to put it out each time. It just it just makes it easier for you to be like, oh, what are my options every single time? So write uh, write out to the screen your options. Do 
Okay, so well, that's there. Okay, so now we're saying like, what would you like to do? You read the player's action. This he does one, two, three, or four. So in this case, uh, we're going to handle sl uh, slot number one now. To start, we're, it's, you chose to single attack the giant enemy crab. We're going to say, we're, so you chose to single attack the, and then I'm going to end this here, and bring it here, and then it's out here. Uh, first enemy dot name. So you chose to attack there. Now what we're going to do is create a random int that we're going to use to attack. So when you create a random number generator, the random number generator generator has to be a, a variable that exists because it random isn't true random. So you have to be able to uh, generate the random numbers from a, from a, a variable. But basically what that means is I'm going to create a random class which is a class that already exists through the .NET framework and .NET Core framework. And we're going to call it random equals new random. And basically we created a random class. Create and store the random class. So now if we go down here, we can say uh, apply the attack damage to the enemy. Now how do we want to do this? We can do this two ways. One's a, both are valid, one's good, one's bad. It's you know it's bad bad coding practices. you might not necessarily want to do it that way, but uh, the, the bad the kind of bad way is to say like the enemy or the first enemy dot health equals the first enemy health so uh, you know set the first enemy's health to what the first enemy's health existed minus uh, random dot next next which gets you your next random number here so now we're going to minus his health uh, by a random number so one issue with this right now is that random.next does any random integer. It could be one, you did one attack damage, or it could be 8,632, in which case you did a critical attack and hurt him bad, but we don't necessarily want to do that. Uh, so here, uh, next, as you can see, has two overloads. So you can either call it like this with no parameters, or if I hit the down arrow right here, or down on my keyboard, or up, you can see that I can give the max value which returns a non-negative random integer that is less than the specified maximum, or we can go to a min value and a max value. So in this case, I want to say you, you can attack either between 1 and uh, upper bound, uh, let's say 1 and 15. So you, you can attack, you can either hit him for 1 damage or it could be 15 damage. The, the, the issue with this though is, is that now the, the program here is in control of handling the enemy's health. The, what you should have is each class should be uh, capable or handling its certain function. In this case, program should be handling the program, which in this case is the, to handle the RPG game. The program doesn't need to know how to take health away from the enemy. The enemy should know how to take away health from himself. The, like what happens when the player enemy get, I mean the enemy gets hit because that's just the enemy needs to deal with that. The, the program doesn't care if, if the enemy got hit. It's, it's like working about what it's what it's doing. So in this case, the enemy class, we're going to make it. We're going to make a function. So this function is public because we want to be able to call it outside of the class, and we're going to return nothing from this class, which will return later something. But uh, right now, this this class is going. I mean, this function is going to, to return nothing. We gotta give it a function name. Uh, uh, is or let's say gets hit, and then inside the parentheses, squiggly squiggly, we're gonna say what we want to pass into this function, and we're gonna pass in a, a hit value. So we're gonna do the code here, and we're gonna say this gets called when the enemy is hit. And the hit value is the amount of damage the 
enemy should take. Or, or enemy will take. It's not should. He will take this damage. Okay, so here we're going to say, uh, here, like, subtract the hit value from the health. So here we're going to take my health of my enemy, and it's going to equal my health of my enemy minus the hit value. And then we're going to do an if statement here, just because we want to want to see that check if the enemy is dead. So if health is less than or equal to zero, the enemy is dead. The enemy is dead. So now we're going to make another function. And then just to kind of show that this, this function I'm going to make private. Private void die. <laughs> and then we're going to say called when the enemy is supposed to die. So now uh, what this is going to do is write to the console that the enemy is dead. So here I'm going to say that the enemy name uh, has died. And then here we want we need to call it. So if health is less than zero, we need to call the function die. So now basically that means when you get hit, you pass in the hit value. It's like, hey, I hit you for 30, 30 points. I minus 30 points from my health. Now, is my health now less than zero? If so, then run the die function. Otherwise, don't, and you skip by, and you don't run die. And then if you run die, it's going to write out to the console that this person has died. And then, you're, then it's going to set the Boolean that this enemy has died. So now, is dead equals true. So now when you die, it says that you died and you, you are now dead. Now, uh, I'll show in a second here. Public means that you can call get hit from any other uh, class, but private means only you can only call this function inside of the enemy class. So enemy, like inside all this code here, I can call this function die, which you saw I used die inside of this gets hit, but I can't call it outside. So what that means is like here inside program, we have this first enemy right here. And if I say first enemy dot uh, gets hit, you see here the function gets hit. I can say gets hit, but do you see die in this list at all? I don't. I don't have the ability to do die. Die doesn't exist. I can check it. I can check if he's dead, but I don't have die. So if I type in die, you can see uh, down here. Uh, you can't really. I'm blocking. Oh wait, wait. It says right here. Enemy die is inaccessible due to its protection level. So that's because the protection level is, is private. If I was to set this to public, then this code works now. However, I can just tell him to die. And why why do I get to decide that he dies? He should only die when when the enemy runs out of health, like what, what the enemy decided. Uh, so so this this sort of thing is is based off of what you're programming. Like it's not always you know right or wrong answer. Technically, you could put public, and, and as long as your programmers don't mess it up, you know it's right. But this way, you're kind of you're kind of restricting yourself. You're, you're saying like, I should never be able to tell this guy to die. He should only die when his health goes less than zero because he got hit. He can only die if he gets hit, and his health goes less than zero. So here we're saying that for the player's attack, where we hit him for the first one, we're going to we're going to do this. A little differently, we're going to say dot gets hit, and then we're going to put those in parentheses. So we're saying when the enemy gets hit, pass in an integer, which this is getting a random integer between 1 through 15 inside here. So the enemy is going to get hit between 1 and 15 on this. Uh, okay, and then it's going to. Um, it should it should probably write out that he got hit. Um, write out that the enemy got hit. So I'm gonna say uh, 
was hit for uh, oops damage 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 so uh, we're gonna write out giant enemy crab was hit for six damage or whatever so in this case we did our single attack and then we're hitting the enemy then after this enemy hit goes we're going to go down we're going to skip all these things and then loop back up and ask to continue so in this case this is going to happen until the enemy dies because once once he dies in the get hits function the first enemy is dead will then change to true so is this enemy not dead no he is dead so then we leave the while loop so at this point two option two three four does nothing but if you attack you'll attack in between one through fifteen damage and it will uh, it'll keep going I can keep attacking attacking until he dies and then the program will end so now if I run this we can see that so what's your name? Warrior David. So I'm going to attack with one. It says you chose to single attack the giant enemy crab. Giant enemy crab hit was hit for 11 damage. Ooh, that's good. That's better than 10. What would you like to do? Well, again, I want to, I'm gonna do two just, just to mess with you guys. So you chose to three strike attack, but right now it's not doing anything. So I'm just going to single attack. So I hit for seven damage, six damage, I should probably write out how much health he has left. It's probably good. Uh, yeah, let's do that before we continue. Uh, so we're going to go here to the enemy. Was hit for blah, blah, blah damage. He now has health remaining. So, oops. This is Warrior David. <laughs> Warrior David has encountered a giant enemy crab. So I'm going to attack. So it's a giant enemy crab was hit for 13 damage. He now, I put no, uh, spelling mistake. He no has 87 remaining. So as you can see, I'm attacking, he's going down. And this one should kill him. Oh, unless he's lucky and gets only four. So he's two damage, so if we attack him for one. Okay, boom. So that he is now has negative nine health remaining so the giant enemy crab has died and the game is over and i have won um he now has that okay so that ends this video's uh lesson on uh classes uh and how class functions and properties can be used to uh and, and inheritance uh to show how classes can be used to specify certain objects and be like this is a player this is an enemy this is a boss, a boss is an enemy, and then you can kind of combine its its features together. And then in the code, you have simple, like written English out words, like, oh, this enemy gets hit. And then you can have it do certain things of that nature. Join me in the next video to learn about for loops when we do the multi-attack and uh, build the enemy attack cycle back, where we're going to defend and be able to run away and switch statements where we rewrite the if statements here to handle uh, switching a little better. See you then. Welcome back everyone. In today's video, we're going to be going over uh, four loops for the multi-attack. We're gonna be able to attack multiple amount of times without duplicating code using four loops. We're going to build the enemy cycle where the enemy can attack back. And we're going to uh, change the if statements to switch statements to show kind of how switch statements are a different type of uh, case statement uh, ability. First, we're going to go handle the for loop. So if you remember before, for our player, he we have four options. You could either choose to do a single attack, which we already coded, where you uh, do a random attack between 1 through 15. We do a three strike attack. Uh, which we're going to build now, which we need to do a three strike, defend, and attempt to run away. So for the three strike, which is here, we're going to say you chose to three strike attack. Uh, we're going to add here the three strike attack, the 
All right, we're gonna end the quote. And just, just like above, which is right here, we're going to uh, just put his name. So we're just saying like, oh, you decided three strike attack the enemy name. So you know what the enemy name is. So how are we going to do the three strike attack? Well, if you remember, we have this ability or this function we made called gets hit. So we can attack the enemy with a random attack three times. I mean, one, one time happens here. The first enemy gets hit, does damage between one through 15. We can copy and paste this three times and we have the three strike attack. Yay, all done, right? No, this is bad coding practice. You don't, in this case, we're only doing three so it's fine, but what happens if you had a 100 strike attack? Are you just gonna hold paste and put the code in that many times? Technically that would work, but that's not good. You, good. Good coding practice would be to put this in a for loop where you write the code once and repeats multiple times. And in this case, this code is unmaintainable. What happens if this number gets changed here and then all of a sudden randomly you're like, oh, uh, there's a bug that on attack six can only be, can, can only do one damage or like it's, un it's unreadable. What if you're reading the code and you're like, hey, player's actions two, console line, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, gets hit? Why Why he's getting hit this many times? How many times is this? I, do I have to count each individual one? It's, it's not maintainable. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to write a for loop. A for loop is different than uh, a while loop that we did before, where the while loop says, do this while this condition is true. A for loop uh, says do everything inside this loop multiple times up to a number of times. So you could say do this three times, do this eight times, something of that nature. So in this case, uh, we're gonna do it three times because it's a three strike attack. So uh, as I've mentioned before, if you type in four, it is a code snippet. So you can hit tab tab and it'll write itself for you because C sharp and Visual Studio, yeah. So. Here we have the first part of the for loop was where you define the counter variable. By default, this is always called i, uh, but if you name the variable before as i, you would have to change it, or if you uh, want to change it to something else, you can. This doesn't have to be an int, but normally it is an int. You can count by any anything you want, but in this case, an int, an i, and it starts at zero. For most uh, arrays, which we'll talk about later in, 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 uh, in programming, you tend to count from zero. So zero through nine would be 10, 10 separate numbers, because it's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, as opposed to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, so we start here at zero. Now, then the semicolon here then says the next part is how many times do you want to repeat? And we're going to say this has to, this, 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 uh, code here has to result in a boolean of either true or false. Uh, when we say i is less than length, we're able to say how many times we want to go. So in this case, we're saying three. So if it's zero is less than three, true. One is less than three, true, continue. Two is less than three, continue. Is three less than three? No, because we didn't say less than and equals two. We said is less than. So three is not less than three. Therefore, you only ran the code three times, which is what we want. You could also, if you wanted to count a little differently, even though I would not recommend this, if you said equals one and then less than equals three, then you have one, two, three, but you have equals, but then that's, you're not going to see that very often. If you look up something on Stack Overflow, you're trying to get help with programming, people aren't gonna tend to write like this. You typically would, would count, start counting from zero and it would be less than that number. Um, because this is saying you don't you don't end on three like three times happens but since you started at zero it's gonna technically I is gonna be two at the end of this but which is same so after this semicolon you, we, we say what we're we gonna do with I afterwards in this case we're saying I plus plus and what I plus plus means is the equivalent it's a shorthand uh, trick of saying I equals uh, I have to do it in here. I equals I plus one. Uh, if we do that and this are exactly the same thing. 
So i equals i plus one means that, you know, assign i to the value of the arithmetic expression on the right, which is what the current value of i is plus one. So if this is four, take four plus one, now it's five. Here we're saying uh, plus plus is just saying exactly this, like take i and add exactly one to it. There is no plus 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 plus, like you can't just you can't just go crazy on the pluses and then expect it to add two. You know, it, 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 there's, this is a little shorthand for literally adding one to a number is the i plus plus. So in this case, you know, since I said we have to comment everything, loop three times to perform our multi attack. Now. We know from the single attack what we can do here. And then in this for loop, we're going to put that uh, get uh, enemy gets hit attack for 1 through 15. So in this case now, we're going to come, the code's going to run. We're going to get here. We're going to go through the for loop. It's going to count at 0. So the first time through, the enemy's going to get hit. Now after this parentheses here, and it comes back at the top, i plus plus means that i is now increased by one. So now i equals one, it's less than three, yes. Gets hit again, comes back up, loops around. Now i equals two, i is less than three, yes. The enemy gets hit, loops around, i equals three, i is not equal less than three. Now we just skip this and continue past that code. The code here now runs after, after three as we're going down. The code is read from the top to the bottom. Um, in this case, we don't need to do anything else. But So in this case, we just did a multi-attack, hit him three times, and we're good. So let's, uh, let's try that out. So I'm building the code. I hit F5 on the keyboard. OK, so what is your name? Good. Thank you for your name, David. You've encountered a giant enemy crab. What would you like to do? I would like to do a three-strike attack. Boom. It says you chose to three strike the, the giant enemy crab. So giant enemy crab was hit for four damage. He is now 96. And what would you like to do? So as you, as you can see, I attack three times. I wrote the code, the attack code once right here. But it, since it's in a for loop, it happened three times. Now, if I wanted to, just, just to be funny, let's make it 300. And you'll see that when I do the... Uh, multi-attack now it's going to occur 300 times all right so now we're going to do the three strike attack which is actually 300 strike attack so now we attacked him 300 times as you can see you can scroll through the console and see all the times we attacked him and uh seems like he died on like the 20th hit or something and then after that we just went really overkill we just literally beat his dead body this giant enemy crab just sitting there we're just like okay so let's uh let's get rid of this this three hundred because that's a little excessive. We're only gonna do three because it's a multi attack. Uh, so that's the first part uh, of the tutorial. Now, for the enemy to attack back, we want the enemy to be able to attack back the player. So we're gonna do something uh, similar to this gets hit, but for the player. So if we go over to the player, we can say we're going to make a new function that's public. So public void gets hit. So we're going to name it the same as the other function. The player gets hit, which is going to be very similar to this function. So we're going to take the hit value and uh, actually we're going to, we're going to copy this just because it, it'll be a little quicker instead of typing it all. So this is called when the player is hit. So we got to make sure we change the comment. If you copy and paste whatever, make sure you read over what you copy and pasted. Because if you just copy and paste random stuff, people are going to start knowing and you're going to possibly introduce uh, code error. And what I mean by people are knowing is if, if, if you copy and paste it like this right here and we're in the player and it's like this gets called when the enemy is hit, people are going to get confused. Like, why is this called? Why is players get hit called when the enemy is hit? Shouldn't the enemy be hit? And then, and then it causes confusion. It's like, did you just copy and paste this? So that's why you gotta change it. It's like when you copy a test answer at school, you gotta change your name, right? Don't do that. Uh, this is called when the player is hit. Uh, hit value the amount of damage the player 
will take. So here, we're going to subtract our health value. That's still correct, because we want to minus our current health with the value of the, uh, the hit value. And then we want to write out that the player, write out that the player got it. So it's player got hit. So now we know it's also a spelling mistake in the enemy uh, function. So name was hit for hit value damage. He now, or I'm going to say you because we don't know if it's he. You now has, you now has. He now has so so we it's half for us. You now have what have injured I'm gonna say health remaining. Okay. Check if the player is dead. And then if so the player is dead. In which case we will add a die function, which is going to be very similar to the player function. I mean the enemy function called when the player is supposed to die, right to the council that the player is dead, the name has died, set the boolean that this player has died. And we don't have is dead, but we can add is dead, uh, which is similar to uh, determines if the player is dead. Okay. Hold on a second. Must hydrate. We took in the player's action. We performed an action off of the player. Now we want to give the enemy the chance to attack. So this if else chain goes all the way here. So after the end of this else, if we go after these squiggly lines, this is where the code is going to continue in this while loop. So now we're going to say have the enemy attack the player. Have the enemy attack the player. Okay, so here we're going to say player dot gets hit, and we're going to do the same random uh, code. Oops, random dot next, and we're going to attack one through five because this this enemy is weaker, so we can only attack one through five. Uh, so the enemy is going to attack, and then it's going to pass here, loop, and continue. So at this point. The way we have it, which I'll, I'll show real fast, uh, I'm going to say David, uh, let's see, two. So I attacked him three times. He's got 76 health remaining. And then David was hit for one damage. <laughs> After all that, I hit this guy so many much, and he hits me one, one damage. I have 99 health. This giant enemy crab isn't, isn't too in intimidating. So what would you like to do? So I'm going to attack him once. And he's like, you chose the single attack, the giant enemy crab. Uh, giant enemy crab is hit for six damage. David is hit for one damage. You have now 90. Oh, this guy's, this guy's getting unlucky. Now he hit me for three damage. Now I got 95 health. So so as you can see, we're, we're going back and forth. The issue now is going to be when I kill this guy uh, I kill him. We, uh, if I if I die, uh, I, I got unlucky there. Cause here, here, let me uh, let me let me change this here, and I'll, I'll be able to show you. So if he attacks one thousand uh, to two thousand, you'll see that the problem is that if at this point David was hit for one thousand nine hundred fifty damage, this giant enemy crab ate his breakfast this morning. You now have negative 1,850 health remaining, so David has died. What would you like to do? Attack. So now I'm dead and I'm attacking. We have to end the game there. So we have to add additional checks here to the while loop. So if we go to the while loop, you can say, while the first enemy is not dead and the player is not dead. So I'm going to change the comment because the comment still has to make English sense so people who are reading will know. While the first enemy and player are not dead. While the first enemy and first enemy and player are not dead, repeat the playable cycle. So this is going to continue until somebody dies. So let's see this in action. So I type in David. I'm going to do my single attack. And you can see that David has died. 
and I now left the program. Yeah, right here. So I said, we'll show reading. David has died. And then the program stops and it ends. So now I'm going to show switch statements where we can do the same thing as if statements, but switch statements might be a little, a different way of putting out actions. Now, it, there's, there's certain times you wanna make switch statements as opposed to if statements, and that's based off of the code structure and what items you're currently doing. It's not necessarily the case that one is better than the other. Um, it's just preference and, and in terms of use. So in this case, we have the if statement with if and then is el else and then if else and then player. All this is based off the player's action. So if we're just determining based off the player's action a certain route, we can use a switch statement instead. So here I'm going to say exactly what it was here. Check what the what action the player took. So in here I say switch and I could hit tab tab as I mentioned before. So it's switch, what do you want to switch on? So see, you can see the little helper thing says what's switch, switch on, expression is switch on. Uh, in this case, we're gonna switch on the player's action. So now, when you have a switch statement, you say the case, so in, in the case that the player's action is one, the string one, then do the following, the code. And then case two, and then three and four. If we don't match any of these cases, we're going to fall, like when you choose five, you go into the default case, and then you go inside there. Now, when you have cases on top of each other like this, case one, two, three, and four are going to do the code. That's, that's going to be in here. Code here. Basically, the cases here keep falling down until you say break, that's where the code will break. So here, if I say break here, and I could say console dot right line, I'm gonna just I'm gonna just put something here so you guys can see. So here, if I say case one, two, or three, it's going to fall down until it reaches a part where code starts. It's going to write out test, and then it's going to stop. And then by breaking, you leave this switch statement and then you continue your code down here. In the case of four, I'm going to come to the switch statement here. And uh, because, of the, because of the default, this is good, this is on the error here. Uh, I'm going to do break here. So, so in case four, we're writing out the console line test and then we're breaking and we're continuing on. If I entered five for the player's action or, or just hello or something of that nature, there is no case. So we go to the default here and then we immediately break out and continue and do nothing. So in this case, we're just going to copy and paste the code that we already have here into the switch statement just so we can have it in a switch statement way. So here, if it's if it's one, we're just gonna put one, except now we gotta say break. So we, we break and stay inside one. And then two. And then we're gonna say break. And three. Oh, okay. As I was gonna say, I'm seeing little, little errors here. And then for right out that we chose for, and then five. You chose to do something else. So now this if statement, I can just delete all of this. So as you can see, it's written in a different way, but accomplishes the same thing. We're switching off the player's action. And then in, in the case that the player's action was one, it'd be good. Now, now you wouldn't be able to do this if, if you wanted to have the if statement be like, well, if the player is dead, else if the enemy crab is dead, else if the player's action is two, else if today's date is Saturday. 
Like if you had it on multiple different things, you would have to have multiple if statements. But if it's always going to be off of one thing, if the player's action is this, else if the player's action is this, else if the player's action is this, else if the player's action is this, then you can do a switch statement because you're switching off of the player's action. You're making a switch off of what he chose. You know, you're sitting here, I have a single thing, I'm making a switch on what I'm doing based off of if you chose one, two, three, or four. So, but you could still write it with a, a, if else. This is just, you know, this is how you can do it. So it, as just a review for today, or, or this video, we made it so the player can die, the enemy attacks back. Once the player or the enemy dies, we leave this while loop, and we now have a multi-attack. In the next video, we're going to create the ability to defend. And I'm actually going to change this because I don't really see the point of running away. I'm going to change this to be heal. So you can heal yourself. So you can defend or heal yourself. So we're going to implement the ability to defend or heal yourself in the game. And then we're going to encounter the boss character where we do the same uh, the same game flow as this except instead of attacking the giant enemy crab we're going to attack the boss so thank you for watching and please subscribe to get uh video notifications hit that bell bell notification to get notifications and i will see you in the next video welcome back in this video we're going to be going and creating the defend and heal abilities of the player we're going and we're going to have the uh player be able to defeat the giant enemy crab and then encounter the boss and then handle the boss character uh, and how we're going to do that is first we're going to start with renaming uh, runaway to heal as you know from the last lessons I created four abilities uh, as you can see here single attack theory strike attack defend and then run away I have changed runaway to heal just because I didn't really necessarily see a point to run away as opposed to heal uh, heal allows you to heal up maybe before like the boss fight. It's kind of like a choice. So we're going to be forced to make these have these fights in this game. You have to fight the giant enemy crab and you have to fight the boss, but you can heal. So that's a plus. Okay. So we have to change this just instead of that you chose to run away. You were going to say well, you chose to heal. Okay. So first we have to make the ability for the player to heal. So here we have a gets hit but we're just going to make a new function and we're going to call it heal so in this one we're going to call it heal and i'm not going to pass in the value you want to uh heal because i'm going to generate that uh, no I'm, I'm gonna have you pass it in so so since we have the random generator in the other one uh you can pass in the amount to heal so int amount uh to heal so I'm going to pass it in here. We're going to name this function or document this function with comments. Always good practice. And we're going to say uh, heals the player with the amount to heal. And the amount to heal, the number amount to heal the player. So now here we're just going to say heal the player by adding the amount to heal to the player's health. So in that case, we're going with health, our current health. We're going to equal it to health plus the amount to heal. So now we're adding uh, our health there. Now we're just going to let the player know his new health value. So here we're gonna write out to the console, we're gonna write line, and we're going to say, we're going to say our name. So name has healed. And we're going to say uh, health. So David has healed six health. You now have. We're going to output the health push, health remaining. So basically now we're writing out that, you know, we want to personalize it. So David has healed, let's say six health. You now have 96 health remaining. So that it'll come out. 
So this is what we're going to do for heal. We're going to go over to the heal right here. And we're going to say heal the player a random amount. We're going to say player.heal. And I copy and pasted the above here, random.next. And I just put that here. And that allows us to heal a random number between 1 and 15. It's not always guaranteed that you're going to heal great. You could only heal one. You could heal multiple. I mean, it's up to you to tweak those values. If you want, you could always say that no matter what, heal does 50. In which case, you know, if you get down to 20, you heal, you have 70. Um, but in our case, I'm just, I'm, I want to make, want to make it a little bit of random. Uh, so this says choose to defend and I just made it heal, which is incorrect. I'm going to cut this with control X and then control V for paste. And we put that in the heal because it's, it's in the wrong spot. All right, so you chose to defend. So how are we going to handle defending? So there's multiple ways you can do this, but the way I'm going to do it for this particular case is I'm going to make a Boolean value to switch if he is guarding. So basically just assume, you know, the player's sitting there, hey, I'm coming after you. And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, I want you to guard. I'm guarding. And then the player, the enemy attacks and then, all right, what's next? So basically, I want to know, is the player guarding? Uh, get set. Uh, I should have did the prop prop there to show you, but I forgot. So determines if the player is guarding. So by default, booleans are false. So by default, the player is not going to be guarding. So here, what, what happens when the player is guarding? First, I'm going to go over to the get hit function and I want to say uh, that I want to check if my player is guarding. So when I get hit and I am guarding, check if the player was guarding. So if is guarding equals true. So when you say equals equals, you can say, does the Boolean is guarding equal equal true so does this boolean on the left equal true however since this is a boolean this technically is in the back end true or false this is essentially the same as writing true equals true so technically for booleans you can just write uh the boolean and if it's false then it will fall out and if it's true like it's a little bit of a shorthand if you want there's there's nothing wrong with it you, you could say equals equals true oh uh and if you want to do it the opposite way you could say equals equals false, or if you wanted to do shorthand, you could say is not true. So by saying not, uh, if, if is guarding was false, then you, it would be true because it's the opposite, and then you would get in. In this case, I want to know if I'm guarding. Am I guarding? Uh, and then else, what do you do when, since true or false, I don't necessarily have to say an if, if else. I'm just going to say if you're guarding, then do this. Else, you're not guarding, so you do this. When we're not guarding, we're gonna get hit and we're gonna lose our health and we're gonna we're gonna write out that we get hit. So I'm gonna hit control X to cut and then I'm going to paste that here. So if I'm guarding, I'm going to do something else. If I'm guarding, I'm just going to write out that the player guarded the attack. So here I'm going to write out console that right line. I'm going to say name guarded the blow and was unharmed. Yeah. So David guarded the blow and was unharmed. So is guarding. You managed to completely nullify the next attack. Um, so better hope that you go out at a 15 attack instead of a one attack. Um, and then in which case, once this if statement comes by, it writes out that you guarded it, then we completely miss the else because uh, we were guarding, so therefore we're not guarding. Uh, it, it's not like we were not guarding, so you will not hit this. So you go here, then it's going to check if the player's health is less than zero. We did not change our health, so our health is not less than zero. So we skip this if statement and we continue. Um, yeah, so that's what's gonna happen when you guard. You're gonna avoid avoid the blow. So now we're gonna go back to our program and handle that for the player. And we're gonna just say set 
that the player is guarding. So here we're going to say that the player is guarding equals true. So now we're just saying that the player is in a state. So basically we're saying like, hey, and the player's sitting there, hey, right. And then it's like, hey, he chose to defend. The player is guarding. So now I'm just sitting there. The, the state now of the player is guarding equals true. I'm just sitting here defending. Yeah. So now when it comes down and the enemy attacks the player, it's going to go to this function where I say go to definition. I right clicked it and I said go to definition or F12. And we see that when we get hit, I say if the player is guarded, then we guarded the attack and we're unharmed. Last problem that I forgot to put in here is that once we guard, we set that to true, we never set it to false. So you're just permanently guarding and you'll never be hurt again. Even if you attack, you're just permanently guarding. And that's not good for a game because then you become invincible. So right after is guarding, after I write out that he guarded the blow, we say remove the guard. And then we can just say is guarding equals false. So we reset it back to false. So I'm guarding, I get hit, oh, I blocked it, and now is guarding equals false, and I get back to it, ready to attack. Now I could guard again, or I can attack, or I can flurry attack. You know, I could do, do things of that nature. My suit's like, what are you doing? So uh, let's, let's try it out. So here, the great, we have the great epic warrior David. And now I'm gonna go through a full game now, just trying uh, to defeat the giant enemy crab. So first I'm going to attack the giant enemy crab. Uh, and he was hit for eight damage, and then I died with one hit of 1,669 damage. And the reason that was, is because I forgot to change that from the previous video, that the enemy can attack extremely strong. I only want him to attack one through five. Yeah, that, that giant enemy crab was was boss levels, he's not supposed to be the boss. So we're, it's not so epic warrior David, because I was pretty weak before. So I'm going to do a single attack. You chose to single attack the giant enemy crab. The giant enemy crab was hit for 12 damage. He now has 88 remaining. The not so epic warrior David was hit for four damage. You have now have 96 health remaining. Now at this point I have 96 health and I'm like, oh, I want to heal. So I'm going to go heal. It's like you chose to heal. The not so epic warrior David has healed eight health. And I now have 104 health remaining. And then after that, after I healed, the giant enemy crab hit me for four damage, so now I have 100 health remaining. So what would I like to do? Well, I want to defend. So now I chose to defend, so I'm just sitting there blocking, and the not-so-epic warrior guarded the blow and was unharmed. <laughs> what would you like to do? So in this case, I still have 100 health, uh, but I'm going to do a three-strike attack. Ba ba ba. So the crab is hurt. I mean, I was hit for one damage, so I have 99 health remaining. This crab is pretty weak, uh, so I'm just going to continue beating it down. I have no fear, and the giant enemy crab is dead. So we have that good. Um, just one thing I want to do. It's literally not a problem, but I kind of think I should prevent overhealing. Why? Why wouldn't you just in the beginning just heal, 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 and all of a sudden you have? 9,999 health, you're not gonna not gonna die. So in the heal function, I'm gonna right click and go to definition or I could have just switch to the file because I have it here. I said heal equals heal plus the amount to heal. Now just to uh, confirm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this in two ways. One, we have an if statement here where we can say, I'm just gonna write it out because I'm not gonna do this one. Uh, I'm going to say if health is greater than 100, then set health to 100. So in this case, I say I healed it. So in this case, I'm like, hey, I spelled that wrong. So health is, let's say, 100 plus the amount to heal, which is 50. Now I have 150 health. Is 150 greater than 100? Yes, then reset health back to the hard number of 100. So yes, I did heal past 100, 
but I'm just going to reset it back to 100. Just reset it back down and don't I don't want to do 100. If this health was 90, it's not greater than 100, then I skip this if statement and just go here and continue. Therefore, I only have 90, which is all fine. However, this, this is a completely valid method and, and normally I would do this. I just prefer to have less lines of code when you could do shortcuts or things. Now there's this uh, uh, operator called the, I think it's tenerary or ternary. I think it's ten tenerary operator. And what that does is allows you to write a single line if else statement in line in code. So what does that mean? I Well, in here, I'm going to say if the health plus amount to heal is greater than 100, then if it's true, health equals health plus 100, else it's 100. And then just to make it a little bit more readable, Oops, I missed. I'm gonna put these here. So, so is this this? And when you put in parentheses, it says like, do your uh, Boolean evaluation around this set of code. If the health plus the amount to heal is greater than 100, now this is the ternary operator where we're doing an inline if statement. Now the first thing after the question mark is what happens when this is true. If this is true then health plus the amount to heal is that that's what that's what it is so let's say 60 plus 10 equals together and that's what health equals else which is do donated by the colons it gets reset to 100 so this is the way i would prefer to do it however as i mentioned you could 100 percent put that if statement it's literally the same thing it's just that this is a shorthand code of writing it and the other one and on, on a single line as the opposed to the other one in, in a statement. Now, when I say when I say like this is the same thing, I prefer to have it as one line because I, I personally feel the code is cleaner and, and smaller with one lines of code, but not everybody might agree. They might want to be able to actually read it. Like, oh, it's more detailed if I write it down an if statement. There's not going the code's not gonna be slower because you wrote, wrote wrote this if statement one way or the other. It's it's just a personal preference. But as I, as I might have mentioned before in other videos, if you're in a team and the whole team is using tenonary operators and then you're writing out if statement, it's gonna make the code be inconsistent. So if the whole team is writing out if statements, write out if statements. The whole team's doing tenonary, you do tenonary. Um, when you're starting out, I, I would just write the if statement because then you know for a fact like, hey, if the, the health is gonna be greater than 100, then just reset it to 100. Uh, I'm gonna leave it here, it's gonna do the same thing. And you'll see right when we start if i come here and heal i healed and i have healed eight health and i now have 108 health remaining because i messed up on something if if the health is greater than 100 then it's 100 else yeah so i completely wrote it 100 percent wrong if the health is greater than 100, then if that's true, then I want to reset to 100. Else, I want to set the health to the, to the value that it was before. I probably made that really confusing, but uh, we'll see here. Uh, four heal. So now you can see I healed one health and you now have 100 health remaining. So even though I heal, I heal, I heal, I'm never getting better than 100 health. You can see I keep healing. I wonder if I'm ever gonna get unlucky and heal less than 100. This guy's not hitting me hard enough to... I'm just curious now. Oh, there we go. Here, I only heal here three health. He hit me and I went to 98, so I only got up to 90, 99. Because I healed to 99, so he hit me with 98. Yep, yeah, cool. We are going to uh, bring out the boss character now. So after all this happens, we, we finish this while loop. So let's go to the end of this while, which, which if we click there, 
we can go down and see this is where because this is part is highlighted this is where the while loop ends and we're going to say here first uh, we stopped this while loop because somebody died so here we want to make sure it wasn't the player uh, if the ch so now we're gonna check if the player was the one who died so here I'm going to say continue writing the code if the player is not dead then we're going to continue the game else the player is dead the player is dead let the user know the game is over so here I'm just going to write line and say game over but in the case that the player is not dead because the player didn't die we're going to go here and we're going to introduce the boss character so now create the boss character and here I'm going to create the boss and I'm going to say boss equals new boss now this boss character we created over here boss is a class that inherits from enemy so a boss is a type of enemy but he's a different type he's a boss instead of being a normal enemy and his name by default is big boss and he has a higher value of health but he can still do the same things that an enemy can, which you know is it can be dying and getting hit and saying saying items. So now this boss, I created the boss. And now I want to uh, uh, do the whole entire game again with the boss character. So in this point we have this while loop. So if I shrink this while loop, it shrinks it shrinks the, the code. It's it's all there inside the dot dot dot. Put your mouse over, you can see kind of a, a little little preview. And this just allows you to kind of like shrink, like, oh, I don't really care what happens in this while loop. I want to see what happens next. You can shrink it. But I'm I'm gonna, I'm shrinking it purely so I can copy the whole entire while loop and then paste it in here. So in here, uh, when, whenever the enemy gets hit, it's going to be boss instead and boss gets hit during the attacks and then we're not looping while the boss and the boss is not that we're just i mean while the enemy's not that we're doing for the boss and we probably should say that right at the screen about the enemy attack so we're going to uh player name you've encountered and then we're going to say boss name so if you remember from the previous stuff i've said in in this uh, video series is what I just did is a hundred percent wrong like technically the codes gonna work I'm gonna show you how it how it works uh, here uh, in a second uh, when I kill the giant enemy crab okay I chose something else what I hit I accidentally hit space uh, so I hit the enemy crab hydrate time All right. The giant enemy crab is hit for twelve. He, the giant enemy crab, has died. I was hit for three damage, even though the crab was dead. That's something. That's a. That's a bug that we need to fix because I, I didn't account for that. Um, and then David, you have encountered a big boss. It's not necessarily proper English, but basically, you have encountered big boss. What would you like to do? So now I'm going to do a single attack. Now big boss is hit for six damage and all the stuff continues. And I'm gonna do this. And you can see here big boss was hit for multiple damage and he has he has more health. He has 144 health. He has more health than the giant enemy crab. So he's gonna be harder to kill. So you see I hit him multiple times and he's, he still has 63 health remaining. And I, I still have 72. I should, I'm, I'm gonna increase the boss's character uh, damage but um, we're just gonna keep going and then eventually we're gonna kill him he's dead the program's over so first I'm gonna explain 
uh, if we're, we're going to fix the bug and then I'm going to explain uh, why this is bad. Which uh, I'll leave you guys a little homework assignment while I'm doing this. Guess why why what I did was bad and why you should not do what I did in terms of creating this boss character. Like how, how this boss character is laid out. Um, so here when the player gets hit, have the enemy attack the player. Uh, make sure the enemy is not dead. And then, so if the uh, enemy, uh, first enemy is dead, if he's not dead, then he can attack the player. Otherwise, he was dead before and he was still attacking. So I'm just gonna say, make sure he's not dead because I could attack him up here for player hit. The enemy gets hit, he could be dead. So check if the enemy's dead before uh, hitting him. Okay. So now, so now we're back here. The that fixes the first bug we encountered. Now the second issue and what what is good practice or not? This portion right here is not good practice because I literally just copy and pasted the above code. We now have the exact same code in two separate places. As you kind of saw, he was still attacking with a crappy value. So I should I should make the enemy, the boss character, go up to like 50. He can do a lot more damage, but these values didn't change. Maybe I, maybe I should say the boss character has a little bit more defense, so he takes you do less damage to him. I have to do I have to change all these values, and and if I want to change the name, everything's just duplicated. The code's unmaintainable this way. What we should do is write this whole entire game loop into a function to reuse the code. Typically, the rule is if you ever write the same code in two different spots, put that code into a function. Therefore, you can call that function in those two spots. It's just a single line function, and then you have the code, single code being called in a single location that if you need to make any changes, it automatically affects every place that you call. So if you had the same code copy and pasted 500 times in your program, and you needed to change a number, you would have to go 500 different places to change the code. If you made it to a function that all the single line of code was inside this function and you put that function every single spot, all that function is pointing to this one code. All the 500 pointing to this one spot. If you change this one thing, it automatically is reflected in all the code. Think of it kind of like if you have to patch something and you wrote it wrong, it might take you like seven days to find every spot, change all the code and test it to make sure it works. And then you have to release a patch that late as opposed to you write the code in the function wise, you change the one value, boom, instantly you're done. 30 seconds, you can release a patch, app is fixed, players are happy. It's just, the other one is just bad practice. It's, it's gonna affect you, it's gonna affect you because of how long it takes to, to code it. It's gonna cost money because of man hours and time, and it's just not good. You wanna, you wanna, don't ever duplicate code if you, if you can avoid it. Uh, and if you can't avoid it, you probably wrote the code wrong. You probably should write it, like think about it different ways to write it. So here in this case, I could make another class to, to hold it and just like name it like a game master or something. But just for the purposes of this tutorial, I'm going to keep it inside the class program. So inside this function, which you see the, the function here main, you can shrink the function here. I'm going to make another function that's private just to this program. No other function, no other class can access this function. And what I mean by that, is the player, the player class and the enemy class, they can't call uh, the game function because that would just, that wouldn't really make sense. So, I mean, they, it wouldn't be able to pull, pull, uh, call this game loop because then all of a sudden, like, you might cause an infinite loop and, and things of that nature. So this function is just private to the program. And we're gonna uh, call this the, and we're not gonna return anything, we're gonna call this the game loop. So in this game loop, we're going to pass in the enemy that we're going to be uh, fighting in the current game loop. Uh, I'm going to call it the enemy. And then we're going to pass in the uh, random number generator that we're using uh, to generate the random attacks. Uh, we're going to pass in the player that we're going to be using to generate the game loop. And I believe that is it for now. So I'm going to put in the comments over here. The main game loop 
that allows the player to attack an enemy. So this, the enemy, the player will attack the random number generator we will use to generate random numbers. And this is the player that we are playing as. Okay, so in here, for this, this loop, we're going to copy the part where the, the while loop here and the console saying we detected someone. So I'm going to go here and paste that in here. And first we're gonna get errors and we're gonna see what we got. So first this is going to write out to the screen about the enemy attack. So it's gonna say player name, you have encountered a, and I called it first enemy dot name. So in this case, I just, I, this enemy now is named enemy that I'm passing in. So enemy dot name. So the enemy that I'm passing into this game loop is the name that we're going to be ex explaining. Because I can pass in big boss or the giant enemy clab in here. And I want it to work for both. So I'm going to check, uh, and since it's saying first, while the enemy is dead, while the enemy and player are not dead, repeat the playable cycle. And then we say what we're going to do. We determine the player's action. And then it's, uh, this enemy instead, enemy, uh, enemy, enemy. And then we continue on. And all the code, because I used the same name, so like player, I named the same here, so technically it's gonna it's gonna work out. And then make sure the enemy is not dead, enemy. All right, cool. So now we can put use that game loop inside of this function. So here, this first part, I'm just going to write uh, to do to do the game loop. So this game loop is while I'm fighting the the uh, giant enemy crab. So here I'm going to say perform the battle game loop. I forgot to make this a static class. Um, and I think that that's will make it show. Yeah. Um, okay. So since this this is a static function, it can only uh, see other static functions inside this this program class. So static um, allow means that you do not need to create an instance of program in order to use it. So then it would just be program capital program dot game loop allows you to do it. I would kind of avoid that right now. That wouldn't be uh, necessarily an issue if I put it inside a different file, but. The difference, I'll have to explain static in, in a more advanced uh, video because it, it's a little more uh, in depth for what we're doing right now, but just know in this case, because main was static, I have to call static on, on this guy as well. So now we're gonna fill in the game loop now that it is static. The first, if we type in here, you can see the first thing is the enemy that we're passing in. So the first enemy is the enemy we're going to attack. We have our random generation uh, number here, and this our player that we've already defined is the player we're passing in. So this whole entire function right here, this this function that we made here, is doing that whole entire loop where we can attack, single attack, defend, defend, heal, and get attacked back all the way until one of them dies, then it leaves. Then the code comes here and says, hey, did the player dead die? then game over, else we're going to continue here. We create the boss character, and we have to do this all over again. Well, as you can see now, we can say perform the game battle loop, and then instead of the first enemy, we're now fighting the boss. And then right there, we just wrote, like in this function now, you can see it's barely any lines. We, if the player is not dead, or we, we fight the first enemy, we make the enemy, we fight the enemy. Is the player not dead? Then the boss comes up, we fight the boss. Now we can check. If the player was the one who died, again, and then else, the player is dead. Let the user know the game is over. And then, okay, so so here here's a, a thing that I you know was mentioning before. Don't duplicate code. This is exactly the same. What if I wanted to change it to say different different items? 
So in this case, I'm just going to write to maintain consistency, a private static void function called game over. And in it, we just write out the, the you know, uh, game, game's over. Writes out what happens when the game is over. And then now I can just do game over in this function. The game is over. And now it's duplicated in both spots. So now, some put semicolons in there. I can see it's going in the same spot. It's, it's in this one spot. So now for game over, game over here, if I change this to game over, no, now both codes, it's game over now, game over now. It's in both spots now as opposed to the single spot. So now we're checking if the player is dead. At this point, if you beat the giant enemy crab and you beat the boss, you won the game. The player won the game. So console dot right line congratulations. I'm gonna say your name because you deserved it. Because we got customization. <laughs> congratulations, blah, David. Comma. You defeated all the enemies and save the kingdom. But sadly, sadly, the princess is in another castle. And so the legend continues. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so. Uh, that's the game loop. So. One couple things I want to add to this game loop, however, is right now both enemies attack the same. So in game loop, I want to say, as I mentioned before, the attack that the enemy could do is one through five. I'm going to say here the as an int the max attack power. And I'm going to add that to the parameter here. The max attack power the enemy has to attack the player. So now that gets passed in. And now over here, when I randomly choose between one and five, it's going to be one and the max attack power. So now if I go back to this game loop, which now errors because I've added another parameter, so I need to have another parameter. As you can see, there's no argument that responds to the uh, max attack power, which is the, uh, when I type in here, you'll see it says, this, uh, the main max attack power the enemy has to attack the player. So for the giant enemy crab, we said he only can attack to five, but for the, for the boss, I want him to be able to attack up to 50. And I want the max player, I also want to define similar to that, the max uh, max player attack power and the same thing here the max attack power the player has to attack so I'm going to say that now for the single strike and for the multi hit he has a max amount that he can attack now, one thing I want to notice, it's not, you, you don't normally have your code blown up this big, but if you, if you do find yourself having the point where you can scroll, you could go over here and hit enter and go to the next line because all this code tends to work until, until semicolons are hit. Like I could do this. This is still valid. This is still valid. It doesn't look right. You tend to want to have a little bit of a form to your code. Uh, so I'm not going to do that, but I mean, I'm going to do it for this one just so you guys can see. Uh, here, so it's on the screen still. So I don't have to constantly scroll to the right, but you don't necessarily have to have it all in the same line. So if I come up here to the game loop, for, for the boss, I only want you to have the attack power of 10, but let's say for the giant enemy crab, you can attack up to 20, uh, which is more than what I had it before. But at this point, we have a complete game uh, where we can flow and we're saying, you come into this, this area, you go to attack, you give, you give yourself a name, 
You go, to, you find a giant enemy crab. You now go to attack the giant enemy crab, and you do battle with it. You turn based back and forth, Pokemon style. Then the giant enemy crab dies. Then Big Boss comes out. When you fight Big Boss, you fight him. He's he's a little bit harder. And then once once you beat him, you win the game or you die. So let's play it out and see what happens. All right. So this is gonna be epic warrior, David. Let's hope I. Uh, Let's hope I don't die now that I call myself an epic warrior. So I encountered a giant, giant enemy attack. Well, of course I want to do a three strike attack. I'm going to do a single attack. I'm going to defend. I, bl I took the blow and was fine. Now I'm going to heal because I want to make sure I'm, I'm healthy. And then I heal. we completely, completely negated that attack because I healed for one. So I healed for one, but he did two. I'm going down. I got I to heal more. All right, so I'm going to, I'm going to attack more. I'm going to three strike attack. I'm going to do three strike attack multiple times. I'm 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 pretty doing pretty weak right now. All right, 65 health. I'm gonna do one, and then so now, enemy giant enemy crab is dead, and epic warrior David has encountered big boss. And now, what would you like to do? I'm gonna do a three strike attack. So big boss. Oh, I got lucky with my my hits. 28, 38, and 10. He's got 74 health left, but he hit me for 14 damage. Now I have 50 health. So I'm gonna hit. I'm gonna I'm gonna defend and block his next blow. And I was unharmed, so now I'm gonna heal. And he's hit me for 16, so I'm still I'm going down here. This I might lose. I need to do a single attack. And I, I need to heal more. So I only have 11 health. I, I don't know if I can heal because he can hit me higher. So I should have healed more during the, the giant enemy crab. Um Oh, but I got real lucky with my my three strike attack. Uh, here, if Big Boss was hit, he now has 31 remaining, and then I, I attacked him 14 and 28, so yeah, so that would have killed Big Boss. So Big Boss died on the second hit, and then the third hit, he, he, he was dead, and I hit him again because I was beating a dead horse, and it says, congratulations, Epic Warrior David, you defeated all the enemies and saved the kingdom. Sadly, the princess is in another cast room, and then the game ends. So, as you can see, the game's fully working. If I died, it would have said game over. Um, however, which got, actually got really close. You now have 11 health remaining. It was, it was, a, it was a pretty pretty hard fight. However, there is one last bug that I can see here that we encountered by through play testing, which is obviously you should be testing your game, um, that once I killed him in the multi-hit, I was able to hit him again while he was dead. So we're just going to fix that real quick. And that would be in the uh, enemy gets hit function because he's getting hit uh, uh, no inside the uh, inside the game loop when you are doing the for loop here to attack the enemy we're just going to say here make sure the enemy is not dead if enemy is dead the enemy is not dead then you hit the you hit the enemy because you know if when you when we're looping through we don't want to you want to hit the enemy. So if we kill kill the enemy the first hit, then the second time we loop through we, the enemy is dead, and the third time we loop through, uh, he's not dead. So another way to do it, uh, just just saying for four loops, you could break out of a four loop. Because uh, if this was hitting 300 times and the enemy died on the second hit, it would still run 298 times because, uh, and just, just check, like, is he dead? Yeah, he's dead. I'm not, uh, uh, he's dead? Yeah, 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 yeah. So he's just not doing anything. So actually a better way to do this is, is to check. We're going to hit the enemy because we know for the first time if we got here, we're hitting the enemy. Like, like the first time we know that's happening. And then make sure the enemy is not there. You know, or now, here, now we're going to check if the enemy is dead. So if the enemy is dead, let me break out of the for loop. Now, something like this, writing the code like this, actually does affect the performance of the code. Because if this was 3,000 hits and he died on the second one, I still, this isn't 3,000, I don't even know what this is, uh, 100, 
thousand. So this is three hundred million. So if I killed them on the first hit. I would still have to do 2,999,999,999 more iterations of this loop and process it to check that he's not hitting it. In this case, the way I have it written right now, he kills him on the first hit, checks that the enemy is dead, and then breaks out of this for loop, and it only ran once, and it does not run the other two, two million, et cetera, et cetera. And then you save all that processing power, it makes the game faster. When you're making like serious games with like actual graphics, let's say through Unity, if you ran something three million times per frame in a 60 fps game you would just pretty much freeze the game it would just because it's like every single frame where it has to draw like frame 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 it would have to be like do three million calculations three million calculations three million calculations and it would it would take too long it would not be good so this i'm not going to run it because the chances of me doing a multi-hit attack when he's near dead is going to be kind of hard again actually i might be able to show that um, it's, it's just, uh, it's just this, this fixes the, the, uh, the glitch. Actually, since I didn't change the 3 million, it actually can show this. So this is running 3 million times, but as you can see, yeah, actually, actually did it perfectly. So I'm running it 3 million times, but as you can see, I only, in the process of hitting him for the one multi-attack of 3 million, the moment he died, it says giant enemy crab has died. It did not multi-hit him two, two million times again. It now brought me the big boss, in which case I can hit big boss as many times as I want. Big boss died, and I won. So I'm going to change this back to three because the attack is supposed to be three. All right, and that ends today's video where I made the game loop, etc. There is two videos left in this tutorial series. The next one I'm going to show... I'm going to introduce errors and show how to protect against errors and to debug your code. Right now, because of the way I've been writing the code and I'm, I know how to write code, I haven't really ran into any er errors that stop the code from running. But there are ways that you can encounter codes and you need to, errors, you can encounter errors and you need to know how to handle those errors when you're coding by debugging it and stepping through and finding out exactly what parts are breaking. So Visual Studio has beautiful debug tools to help you figure out where the code has gone wrong and not working the way you expected. Uh, so I'm going to be showing you that in the next video. And then in the video after that, we're going to be finishing this off with uh, a list and a for each loop. And what we're doing with lists, which lists slash arrays, I'm just going to show a way to collect a huge amount of an unknown number list. So everything so far we've been doing is like hard coded, like three, like we're doing this three times. But what if you wanted to do it for how many items were in a list. Let's say you had an attack list of 40 or 60. You don't know, you just wanna loop through the list. Um, we're going to keep a history of every single attack that happens. And then when the game ends, we're going to display the history of the game. So it's like, oh, I attacked you, you attacked me, and then I attacked you and then died. It's like, all right, the game's over. Uh, what happened was the player attacked him you attacked him, uh, he attacked back, and you attacked him. It would basically be like a replay system. Let's think of this as a really archaic Call of Duty kill cam, where if it's tracking your movements, when you die, it replays back what happened. So we're going to create that, that array containing all the um, history of your attacks, and we'll, we'll outprint that to the screen, and that'll teach you arrays and lists and the for each loop, which is the last, last major thing, in my opinion, that you need to know in C-sharp. And then that will be it for the general overview of learning C-sharp. Uh, with this, you should be pretty decent to write basic C-sharp programs. Um, but we're, there's going to be more intermediate subjects, which I will do in the next uh, video series. So thank you for watching today, and I'll see you next time for debugging errors in your code. Welcome back, everyone. Today we're going to go over errors and debugging inside your code. Uh, when While you're coding, a program can crash and that would be an exception. It's called an exception in, in C Sharp, where once it, it cra uh, the program crashes, it throws an exception and the program uh, will crash and basically completely shut down. To prevent that from happening, uh, you can use a try catch loop where you're, if you're saying like try to do this code and if it does an exception, if it throws an exception, catch the exception and do something with it, which would prevent your code from uh, crashing uh, completely. 
and you can do whatever you want to do with that exception, such as log it or report it to the user uh, or anything of that nature. The act of going through your code and looking for bugs is called debugging. So we're going to go over how to de debug your program to find uh, bugs and also how you can prevent it for errors. So as this program so far that we've done, we have not written any code that has erred or could error just because of the way I'm, I, I wrote it. Um, but I'm going to introduce some errors into the code now and then uh, demonstrate. So where we left off uh, was we could do a whole entire battle between the uh, giant enemy crab and the boss character. So here we have our first enemy. Now this first enemy, we create him into an enemy and then we do stuff inside the game loop. So let's say, just for the purposes of causing an issue, let's comment out that line and I'm going to say enemy first enemy equals null. Instead of instantiating the class into an instance of the class here in the enemy, I'm going to make it null, which is the absence of any instantiation and basically saying this this is empty right now this first enemy is of type enemy but nothing is inside of it it is null there is no there's nothing assigned to it and it is empty when we go to perform the game loop we're going to go inside here and then it's going to say here for enemy enemy dot name now enemy right now is null it is nothing Therefore, there is no dot name. There is no name property to nothing. You can't just say nothing, give me your name, because it's going to be like, what? I'm nothing. I don't know what a name is. What are you talking about? If it's not instantiated, it, it will error. So as you can see down here, well, I'm blocking it a little, but right down here in the error, errors area, there is no error, because technically, th this is considered a runtime error. There, there is, in compile time, I have not written any incorrect code. Enemy.name, because it's of type enemy, is correct. It is not going to error here and give me an error message because there's nothing wrong here at the moment. But if enemy is null, it will crash. Now, to show that, I'm going to run, run the game, and we should immediately hit an error after I name, name, name myself. So what is your name? David. And then boom. I hit an error here. And it says exception to thrown uh, on this line. So it comes here and it points and tells you this is the line, line 81. Uh, we, and the exception that we got is a system dot null reference exception. And it says object reference was not set to an instance of an object. So an object reference, which in this line we have an object reference of player and enemy. And it's an object reference because it is not of type, it's not a base type like int or double or anything of that. If it's a class, like then that comes up green here, it's an object. So that's why it's saying object reference. So enemy, random, player, those are object things. So here in the exception, it says enemy was null. So you can see that this here enemy, it, it, in this case, it told you enemy was null and, and this, this helps you. So if we can see if we continue, we can't continue uh, and the program crashes because we didn't do anything uh, with it. We got an unhandled exception. Since this is in debugging mode, this this window did not close and still shows the debug information here, but it's in in a real program, like if this was actually running not in BDB mode, it would just crash completely. You know how like when you're using an app on your phone or a Windows thing and then just boom, and just nothing happens, it just crashes? Um, that's what's happened here because, because we caused an error. So in order to fix that, uh, you basically, put the line that I commented out back in, instantiate it. But we're going to pretend that for some reason you weren't aware that this was set to null. So in order to do that, or in order to, so, so in order to find out, possibly to look into errors, we're gonna debug. And to debug, uh, we, we hit the play, which causes the, de starts the debugging session by default, but Right now, it's just going until we hit an error, then it crashes and it tells us what's wrong. We want to kind of know what's happening before that. So here, to start the, the program, 
here at random, I'm going to put on line 11. If you go to the left here, you'll see like this gray bar. If you click in here on, on what line you want to put, you can put a breakpoint. Now a breakpoint is, is when the code's running, it's going to hit this breakpoint and stop the code and just freeze it on that line. So if I run, run the code now, you can see that the code has stopped and it is highlighted. The yellow shows the line is highlighted at the, the breakpoint and the program has just stopped. You'll see in here, nothing's appeared because it's literally waiting for me to look at the code. Now at the top part here in the bar, can't reach my hand up, uh, you'll see step into, step over, and step out. And what these are, are, are debugging tools to allow you to step into a function, step over a function, and then step out of a function. So in this case, I, I see this line here. Uh, I want to step over, step over this function. You can see that the, the code goes to the next line. So now the random class is generated, and now I'm on the console right line. So with your mouse, you can put it over variables. And, and when you put it over variables, it'll tell you uh, its current state. So here you can see like random is a system random. And if I hit the little arrow next here, I can see uh, the items inside of it. But we don't really, random is not a class that we, we know too much about, so we're gonna ignore that for now. But if we step over, you'll see player. So right now we put our mouse over player. Player is null because this line has not been run yet. If we step over now, you'll see that it, it gets to the point where console.readline is waiting for my input. So I put David. Now it goes to the next line here. So you can see now player exists. It ha it's of type RPG game.player. If I open this up, you can see that the player has health 100, I am not dead, I am not guarding, and my name is David. You can see the actual variables in the program. In this case, this case, in this case, it allows you to verify that the code is doing what you want. So right now I'm like, yes, at this point, my player should have 100 health, he's not dead, etc. So now if, if, if all of a sudden the next line I was dead, I'd be like, why am I dead? I clearly can see I'm not dead right here, and I can kind of determine what's happening. So you can see here like player dot name and if I put my mouse over it's David. But if I wanted to I could also right uh, select player, right click it and say add to watch or add watch. And what that does is I'm going to temporarily remove my webcam. You'll see down here in the lower left the watch, it puts the player in here and I can watch it as it transforms. So when I step through and let's say I get lose health, I can see it go down. And I can kind of watch it as opposed to constantly putting my mouse over player and loading it back up. So now first enemy is null and we're going to step through and it's defined as null and now we're going to go to the game loop. So this is a function right here. If I was to step over I would go to the next line here if but, but we would error because the problem was happening inside the game loop. So I actually want to step inside of this function to continue the look inside. So that's what step into is for. So I stepped into, now I stepped into that function, and we're gonna check that out. Now I'm gonna step over, and here we can see this is the line that's going to error because because we saw it before. So if I put my mouse over player, you can see player.name is David, and then it says enemy, enemy is null, so enemy name is a null reference exception. It shows it right here that that would be the case. So at this point we know that enemy is, is, uh, is the problem. So you, know, you would stop your code, and you would go back, and you would put it in. You would in instantiate enemy. Ta-da! So now the code is fixed. As I mentioned before, you can also use debugging to track, uh, when, let's say, if the health attack was being hit. So if the enemy gets hit, so let's see, let's, let's put a breakpoint here, uh, or, or at the enemy gets hit line. We're going to do a single attack. Oops. So I have the breakpoint up here. I'm going to continue. So I'm going to do a single attack, and you can see the code has stopped. The enemy is going to get hit with a random uh, attack power. So if I step into this function, you can see get hit was randomly, randomly determined to be 2. So now I should know that health equals 100 minus 2. So I should now see health equals 98. So I know this is correct. So now I can say, hey, is health less than or equal to zero? False. So I should not die. I should not be in this function. Yep. 
So now we can see, and now if we put our mouse over enemy and open this up, you can see now the enemy's health is 98 and he is dead. And we can just keep going through here and I'm gonna hit him attack again. And I can see, now step through, I can see the enemy is 94. I can add to watch and then hide myself again. And you can see here 94. And then if I do the attack again, uh, right here, you can see and once I step over, it just went to 93 because I only hit him with one. And then I do that. And then I hit one again, step over. Now it's 92. I'm pretty, pretty weak against this giant enemy crab. I just realized something, uh, which I wanted to kind of point out, in the fact that I, I just realized I'm, I'm pretty weak. Um, the So I'm, I'm gonna get rid of this right here. When I say I'm pretty weak, I realize that the max player attack power is supposed to be 20. I'm supposed to be able to hit up to 20, but the max attack power is five, which you can see I pass into these functions by putting my mouse over it. You can see here max attack power is, is the, the font color is black. Boom, I'm back. Welcome. Uh, so the max attack power is black, while the max attack, max player attack power is gray. And when a variable is here with this gray, that means it's never been used. So it turns out I actually made it and I wasn't using it. So that's a, that's a mistake. So here you can kind of see, by coloring here, I can kind of debug the code and be like, oh, I actually didn't use the variable that I made. Max attack power here has been used. So if I click on it, you'll see it highlights automatically the, the places where it is located. Here it's already located here. You can see it, it's highlighted. So if I click on max attack power here, it's only mentioned in the comment, but if I scroll down, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna see it. So I'm gonna stop the code, and it turns, I'm gonna copy this, because uh, when the player, uh, I mean, when, yeah, when the player hits the enemy, I should be going for max attack power. So here, uh, the enemy is gonna get a hit, and it's the max player power. The enemy gets hit, it's max player power. Um, then I heal. And then when the enemy, when the player gets hit, it's his max power. So now, now we changed it and fixed it where the player can, uh, should give up to 20, 20 damage or so. So I'm going to do a single attack again, and you can see that I hit was nine for damage. Now I did five damage, now I did 18 damage. So yeah, he's getting hurt a lot quicker now. Uh, so let's say, you're doing something that could possibly error. You don't really want to write code that could error. You should do certain things to prevent it. Um, for example, just just saying, here for this 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 first enemy example, this this is going to be just interjected here. But we could do something like if this was being pulled from something that right here it's hard coded to be new enemy. But if it's being pulled from something else and we're not necessarily sure. Why, where it's coming from, it might not be null at the time of, of the code running. So if we did a check right here and said first enemy does not equal null, then we know that we can run the game loop because the first enemy is not null. If we, uh, so this way we checked via code that it is safe now to run this part, which, which is a good practice and you should always be doing null reference checks is what was this is called. So you always want to check for null references, and uh, if it's an object. So hey, it's like I I didn't check here because I, I literally defined it. It can't possibly not be there because it's hard coded to be enemy. I'm going to now delete this, and I want to do a try catch around this game inside this game loop to determine if uh, any error happens. We're going to find out and do something else. So here, uh, I'm going to set first enemy to null again, which will cause it to error. And I'm gonna go inside the game loop, or I'm gonna go before the game loop here. And I'm going to say, uh, I'm gonna do a try catch loop. So as I've mentioned before, if you try, uh, it'll come up with a snippet, tab, tab. So now you got a try. So it says try everything inside these Craig loop braces, try all the code inside here. And if there's any exception that is thrown because 
the term is called throwing an exception. So if any exception is thrown, catch that exception and then do whatever is inside this code block and then you could you could throw it again if you wanted. So if I you this exception here can be given a name and then therefore I can access it. So here I'm going to try to run game loop inside of the program here. And I'm going to say if I run into an error, I could throw the exception. So I could do something and say console right line. And I could say e, which is the exception dot message. So I could write out the error, which is going to be the null reference error to the screen. And then I could throw it again, but it would crash. And this doesn't really make sense. But in this case, like if you want to throw it again, you could you know, log the error to a server, maybe, and then throw the error. So you crashed the program, but at least you knew you have reported it to yourself so you can fix it. The In this case, I'm not going to be uh, throwing the error again. I'm just going to write the error to the console. I'm going to say the program encountered an error skipping this fight. The error was, and then I'm going to say e.message. So just for the purposes of showing this, we're going to say, hey, if there was any error, I'm not going to crash your program, but I'm not going to stop you from playing the game. So you erred while trying to fight the giant enemy crab. Lucky you, you get to skip and fight the boss. Doesn't really make sense, but hey. <laughs> So I'm going to put a breakpoint here to kind of show. I'm going to, I'm going to do it first without a breakpoint, and, and then I'll show you. OK, so David, so we hit the null reference exception. It, since we're in debugging mode, it, it kills here. We're going to go past. And so it says here, the program encountered an error, skipping this fight. The error was object reference not set to an instance of an object. So now, now we continue the code, because I did not crash at that point. So this. We erred on this line, which en ended the code. Any, if there was more code in the try, it would not happen. We erred here, so immediately went to catch. It ran this code, it left the catch, and now we're just continuing on. So the player is not dead, so now I made the boss. And we're continuing. So David, you've encountered a big boss. What would you like to do? And I can fight big boss all the way through. Um, so that's basically a try catch. You, you can put it around your code to uh, to prevent your program from crashing and do things of that nature. So I'm going to put this back here. And I'm just going to show, just for the sake of not causing the program to clash, crash, I'm going to select every single piece of code that I have here inside of the main loop here. And I'm going to hold on my keyboard. This is a shortcut. You could either copy and paste, cut, and uh, of the same nature to do this. But if I hit Control and then hit K and then S, Control K S, it allows me to say what do you want to surround everything that you selected with. So I can say here an if statement, um, an else statement, a for loop, blah blah blah, an if statement. I'm going to say do this with a try. So if I hit Tab you'll see now that everything that I selected is now inside that try catch loop. So here's the try. Uh, and then the end of the try is the catch. So I'm going to put this E and I'm going to say log the error to the console. And then E.message. So in this case now, when first enemy equals null. I'm not going to continue the fight, and I'm just immediately going to uh, crash the program. The program's not going to crash. It's going to say object reference not set to an instance of an object. So it wrote out the error to the screen. And then this is the normal thing that you get when you end. So the program did not crash, but it still told the user what's going on. It's like, hey, we can't continue the program. This is the error, you know, you should report it. In this case, you know, you would typically go to the developer and, hey, hey, I, I entered my name as die, die, and um, I got uh, this error. 
what, what's up? And then the guy will be like, yo, I gotta patch that shit. And then it gets, you know, real intense. So for, I, I wrote the code so far, I know it's correct. So this try catch might not necessarily help us. If I cause an error later on, this might this might be useful, but right now it, I, I tend to do big try catches like this in terms of my functions where I'm like, hey, try everything inside here. If it errors, do something with the error because I personally don't like my code to, to hard crash. If you hard crash, no one's gonna know why. People are gonna be angry at you. If, if you have like, let's say a mobile app and you encounter an error, you could inside this catch here, you can say, you know, pop up an alert and it says you have encountered an error, you know, like on an iPhone, it comes up with a little little card in the middle of the screen, you know, with the OK button. And you could just came, come up and pop up with that error. So instead of crashing the iPhone app, you can have just, you know, everything looks fine. And then all of a sudden this thing pops up and says like, no internet connection or something of that nature. Failed to download, blah. And then the user knows, oh, it failed to download the picture I was trying to get off, off, off the internet, as opposed to just crashing. And you're like, what? What happened? You know, so I, I think it's a good idea to try catch errors. Don't, you don't ever want your program to hard crash um, because that's, that's never good. So thank you for watching. And uh, next time will be the last session uh, for the C Sharp beginner tutorial series where, we're, where we will be going over uh, lists and arrays, which are very similar, and, and uh, the for each loop. And basically, we're going to create a history of all the attacks that the player does. And at the end of the game, we're just going to uh, write out the history on the screen. Um, and then we will be done with our RPG game, where you can fight the enemy crab, fight big boss, and save the princess in a castle. But <laughs> I don't think we're not going to program the princess. OK, till next time. Welcome back, everyone, to the final uh, section of the C Sharp Beginners tutorial where I'm gonna be going over arrays and lists, arrays slash lists, and uh, the for each loop. And how we're going to do this is we're going to take our existing code here and store every single attack that you do into a history uh, list. And then at the end of the game, we're going to say, this is what happened uh, during the game. So it's kind of like a replay feature. Uh, if you want to get real intense, you could say this is like the kill cam in Call of Duty. <laughs> where you can see what happens uh, before you died. But, you know, it's not going to be animated and things of that nature. But this is going to be basically a replay of the whole entire game. So an array, uh, let's say, uh, an array is a list of elements that that is stored inside one kind of, kind of box thing. Like, so we have, uh, let's say, if you have an int called, like, test, or, or let's, let's call the int number, and it's four. The, that, that number is literally four, and that's it, it can never be anything else. But if we had a array of ints, so we call it like number list, or number array, we could have an array where the first slot is one, the second slot is two, the third slot is three, and we can store a huge, you know, infinite amount of, of variables inside this one little container. So you take this one variable and say, like, hey, I have a container of all these, all these things inside of it. So now we're going to specify this by making uh, an int array. So int array. And array is specified by these uh, brackets here. I'm going to call it uh, test, or I'm going to call it int array equals new int array, semicolon. Now it's erroring here because it says it in a, uh, an array creation must have an array size or array initializer. So in this case, we're going to give it a size of five elements. So when you define an array, you need to have a fixed size. So here we're saying that this array is five, five things in the array. So now there is five slots in this array. So now if I want to say int array in the first slot, set it to two. And then we're gonna say six, five, four, three, two. And then one, two, three, four, five. So arrays are count from zero. So the zero array is the first slot. Uh, and the first slot here is technically the second slot because you're counting from, from zero. You don't count from one. It's not like one, 
two, three, you count from zero through nine. And it's and this is due because in, in programming, uh, you, you can't really do 10 because 10 gets into a whole like sec, uh, like way of handling it, like binary wise, etc. So zero through nine represents all the first 10 numbers without going into double digits. So, so zero uh, is technically the first slot then, then you, when you get to nine, you technically said ten things, but you haven't got the double, double digits. So in this case, I'm I'm setting the zero slot, the first slot, then the second slot, the third slot, and the fourth slot, and the fifth slot to variables. Now I also then after that I set a six slot, even though there's only five things in this array, I set a six slot to to six. So let's try running, see what happens. So I erred, and from the previous lesson, uh, if you if we hit an exception, it would just write out the exception on the screen. So you can see, oops, it says index was outside the bounds of the array. Um, so I erred because I tried to access. Uh, this is called an array index. So give me the index with the item inside the fifth spot index. Wise does is outside of here. So there isn't actually. This is saying there's five things in here which means it goes zero through four, which is here. There is no fifth spot, hence why we erred. So this, this line was fine, this line was fine, this line was fine, fine, fine. This line erred because we have just tried to access something like, hey, we only have five things in this array. Like, like we only have five slots here, and you just tried to put six things in. You just tried to put something in this sixth slot. Therefore, it'll crash, and it's not, uh, it won't work. Uh, so we're gonna get rid of this line here, and then you'll see that if I if I get rid of that uh, It goes to what's your name, which is our, our normal portion of the code so At this point uh, If we wanted to access Everything inside this array or anything inside this array we could write it out line out right out the line and I'm gonna say int array. I just want to know what's in the third slot. So int array three and it, it, since this is a counter, I typically just in my mind, I just remember that if I want to know what, what the slot it is, I just add one. So in the fourth slot, I want to know what's inside there, which in this case is four. So we should see four written out on the screen, which we do. So that's basically arrays, it allows you to store multiple things in there, and then you can, you can write them out. Um, but if you wanted to loop through an array and write them all to the screen, we typically would go an array loop, and we would say the uh, length of the array. So when since we're counting from zero, this 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 works automatically from starting at zero and continuing till the length of the array, which is five. Um, write out the number. So int array, and inside the bracket, I'm going to instead of putting the index, I have to put the index, which is a a number, and here so I put it's a variable, it's an int. So right now it's zero, the second time through it's one. So it's like this, this is hard coded, but now I'm doing it via code. And I'm going to write down, out every single thing inside of that int array. So we got four, one, two, three, four. So we got four because I didn't remove this line, but after that you see one, two, three, four, five. So I just loop through the whole entire array and put out, put out the words. So technically I could have a thousand things in this array, write it out, with just this this line of code, and because it's loops, it loops out all a thousand, and boom, they're out. So arrays are efficient; they're quick when you do things inside Unity or game game programming, and you want to do something per frames. Uh, you could you you could use arrays, but I I tend to prefer to use lists, just because they're easier. In my opinion, they're easier to handle, and in this case, we're going to use lists, but Arrays are something you could could use. Uh, you just have to remember like these one, you know ones, twos, and, and things of that nature. It's a little more mathematical and like hard, uh, like like hard coded. Like this, like this is the third index, uh, as opposed to lists, which are kind of more English based. So a list, you specify the type using these brackets. So I want a list of ints, and I'm going to call this an int list equals new int. List. And basically what this does is now this is an empty list right now that has nothing inside of it. 
And unlike an array, I could add things to this array, I mean to this list, without having a set limit defined. Like the array was like, oh, I needed five things exactly. Well, this one, I can add things dynamically. So this int list, I'm going to dot add. I'm going to add to this list the item that we want. So now I'm going to put the five that we kind of showed before, the example. And then we're going to do a for loop again to the int list dot count. It's called count instead of uh, length because we're counting the list. And then console dot write line. And I can say int list and do the exact same thing. So now we get the exact same result, except I didn't have to uh, specify what item goes where. We're just constantly adding. And then, you know, if for some reason I did this, now all of a sudden I have a list of, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's now 12 items outside the list and it just prints out. So. One thing else I, I like about lists is there's a thing that you can add here. When you use using statements, you can get certain functions. If I use system.link queue, what that allows me to do is inside lists, I can say certain things such as give me the first item. So by doing that, I get the first one. So the, the first one would be this one. Give me the last, which would be this one. Give me the, give me another list where all the w's equal four. So here it's saying, uh, get me a list, another list. It gets returned from this, so I'm going to say a new list. Uh, new list. And, and basically this is, I just did a lot of things there without necessarily explaining it. So, so I'll go through it now uh, a, a lot slower, but this new list, give me a list of all the areas where W equals four, where the, where the item inside here equals four. So in that case, I'm only gonna get a list of two items being this guy and this guy. And basically that is when, by using dot where, which was included inside the system dot link queue uh, class, or, or, or func set of functions, I can give it a function parameter here, which is saying, make up a variable name, it could be whatever you want, and then in, in that lambda expression, if w, which is the variable I had, which is the value of the thing inside of there, equals equals four, because this has to be a Boolean if it's true or not, um, it knows to put it inside a list. This turns it into a query and then here are the two lists, we turn it back into a list. Now this, this link queue stuff is, is extremely powerful and important, but this is more intermediate to advance uh, C Sharp. You're not gonna be uh, doing too many, too many things of this nature uh, right off the bat. Um, so since we're, we're staying with beginner, beginner stuff, we're, we're not gonna do this. Um, if we wanted to uh, do this, like this where loop, Loop or where clause allows you to get this new list easily. But if I wanted to, let's say, like comment this out, I could loop through. I can create a list called new list, and I'm just going to create this list. And I could say inside this loop, where I'm looping through every single one of those, if I said that if the number I'm on right now equals four, then new list dot add the one I'm on right now. This would get me the same result as this one line. So you can, like the, the, these, these, that where clause, the link queue stuff, it's just helper stuff that allows you to do stuff easier in one line faster. But you can do everything with the basics that I have taught you in, in C Sharp. That, that's, that's why it's the C Sharp basics, like learning this. Like learning this, you can do anything you want inside code. Other things like this, allow you to do things efficiently, um, like writing it efficiently, uh, and and it just makes it easier for you. But it doesn't mean 
you couldn't do it this way. This is 100% valid. You get the same end result as opposed to this just one line. So all that being said, what we're going to do is create a list of strings. And this list of strings is going to be a game history. So I have defined the game history. And now I'm going to add stuff to the game history. So in the game loop, we're going to add a new parameter, which is a list of strings. And we're going to call this the game history list. And then I'm going to add that to the uh, documentation comment, which is good practice. Uh, contains the list or, or the list that contains the game history that we will add to. So here we're going to just modify things a little bit from the way we, we've done things. So here I'm going to define a list of the strings we will use to write out. So we're going to write a string initial uh, text. We're going to say this equals all of this. And then I'm going to write out initial text. So basically, I just moved everything that's inside of here. Uh, instead of it being an inline string that only exists here, now it exists inside of a variable. Because it's in a variable, I can use this again and again. So if I go here now to console.writeline, I just wrote it out to the screen. Now I'm going to add the string to the game history. So here we're going to say uh, game history list.add. I'm going to add the string to it, initial text. So now I wrote out that text and that same exact test I just added to my history. So I have my first slot inside my list, which is this string, which is everything that we wrote out here. Now I'm going to uh, write out, uh, make, a, make a, another string variable and call this uh, attack text, make that null, and then a string of enemy attack text equals null. So I defined them, but they're not set at the moment. And as I, I spoke about in the debug session, the text is gray because it is not currently being used. And in its underscore green, it says it's assigned, but its value is never used. So if we go over here, you'll see that here we have the attack uh, text is being written out here. You chose to attack the enemy. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to save the attack text. So I'm going to take the attack text, save it there, pop it out here, add the history, game history list, dot add attack text. So of that nature, we're going to continue to write that out to all four of these. And in this case, <coughs> we write that here. Oops. Uh, we chose to defend. And then you chose to show you the enemy. And then we're going to gain add history. So the and then we're not going to handle choose something else. So now when the player gets hit here, the enemy attacked. So uh, something I just want to kind of mention in terms of uh, functions. Uh, I think I missed something here. Oh, I forgot, I forgot to put inside game loop. I got to I got to assign game history list uh, to the game loops. 
No, that I, I mean to the yeah to the game loop function because I passed it in. So now now we're fine. So now we just uh, kept the history of all our attacks, and uh, we have now a huge list of you know a string being like, hey, you encountered enemy crap, and then I chose single attack. So put the string, you chose single attack, uh, and then it's gonna say like the enemy attacked you. I'm just gonna put here the enemy attacked you. Write out that the enemy attacked. Uh, game history list to add the enemy attack the player. So now if we go to the end of the game, which says uh, game is over, blah. So this else here is if the player is dead. So I'm going to shrink this real fast. So you can see that we come and we define the player. We have the game loop. And then if the player is dead, then he, it does, does game over. Otherwise, we do all this if stuff. But after all that's done, either way, I want to write out the game history. So in this case, uh, and before I do that, I'm going to loop through the whole game history. So this is going to show for each loops. If you say for each, and then tab tab, it's going to say for each variable, and then you get the name item. So I'm going to call this uh, history, in game history. So this allows you to do that for loop that I wrote above, but it's now it's easier because it's object based with the list. So we're saying for each history in game history. So it's just like go through this list and every single one of them, every single history inside of game history do is do something with it. In that case, I'm going to console.writeline history, which is the string. So for every every history inside game history, just write it out. So in this this for each loop, simplified everything, wrote it, kind of made it in English. For every single thing inside the game history, write it out. And I want to see the game history. Um, beforehand, though, I should probably say, you know, uh, let the player know this is the history so i'm going to say here right line and then in here and then which is the, the double new line area and i'm going to say right uh this is the history of the game and then two double lines so now you can see that we play it out and i'm going to say david and i'm just going to do uh, three strike attacks just to kind of kill them all quicker. Uh, okay, so wow, I actually lost. Big boss beat me up. So I'm I'm in the middle of fighting big boss, and he had 36 health remaining, but he hit me for 45 damage when I had four health, and he actually defeated me. So probably should, I probably needed to heal during fighting the enemy crab. But then it says game over. David has died. This is the history of the game. So it says, David, you have encountered an enemy crab. You chose a three strike to attack. The enemy attacked the player. And it kind of shows what we wrote in history. And uh, that was it. Um, that essentially is the end of, of all that. But I just want to kind of point out a little bonus thing uh, for function wise that is kind of important that I realized here when I'm doing the enemy part. Here I'm just saying the enemy did something. I'm just like, oh, the enemy attacked the player. But I kind of want to know what the enemy did. Where is it? So when the player gets hit, I'm going to go to this function here that we defined in, a, in like one of the previous videos. Uh, gets hit is uh, right here. It kind of says look how, how much the player was hit for. We could. Right now, we're returning nothing from the function, but if I wanted to return an int, I could say, and then you would want to make sure you uh, write it out inside the, the comment block. This returns the new health or the current health of the player. So we can have this return the new health of the player. So now, uh, by doing that, we could say, uh, Subtract the health value with the hit value. And now we can just say 
return the health from this function. And we're gonna return health. And now the function is returning health. So now in this case, this, this is running, it's returning health, it's not being stored in any variable, so it just falls off. So if I wanted to, uh, which I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to say the uh, enemy attack text equals uh, the enemy attack the player for uh, and the player has blank health remaining. So that's the enemy attack text, and I'm going to add that here. And since this was defined afterwards, it has to go above. So breaking it down, the enemy attack text, which is a string, is going to be the enemy attack the player and the player has. Now the result of this function is going to be, it returns the health values. So this is going to return, let's say you, you have 100 health and you get hit for two, and now it's gonna return 98. So when it says has here, I'm putting a space, then all of a sudden 98 is going to appear here. The player is gonna get hit, it's gonna do all that code and return 98. And then it comes out with health remaining. So in the enemy attack text, I just wrote out that the player has got hit for 98. I actually did attack the player, and then, and then I added it to my enemy attack history. So doing this again, all the way through, I spelled my name wrong. Oops. So doing this again, I do okay. So game over, David died. So David keeps getting killed by Big Boss. Uh, you have the history of the game, and you can see the enemy attacked the player, and the player has 84 health remaining. The enemy attacked the player, and he has 43 health remaining. You can actually kind of give more detail and, and write of that nature. So I believe this concludes the uh, basics of everything that I need. I believe that you need to start a C sharp application. So uh, of everything that we've gone over, we've we've talked about how uh, C sharp is what C sharp it is and how you use it. Uh, and we made a console app with an RPG game, which is, has turn based style based off of uh, the enemy attacks you attack random amounts. Uh, we talked about data types, variables, math operations, strings, objects, if statements while loops, for loops, for each loops, switch statements, try catch blocks for erroring, uh, catching errors, and debugging, uh, arrays and lists, classes and functions. And knowing all that, you could write a C-sharp program. Um, you also, that those basics is the same thing for all programming. That's not just C-sharp. Any programming language has all those, those functions or those, those features, and it's just written in a different way. So if you were now to learn, let's say Python, you would have to learn how to, the only thing that's gonna be different is the syntax. So this is how I write a Python if statement, or this is how I write a JavaScript if statement. It's going to be a little different. Thank you all again for watching this, this entire uh, C Sharp series. If you guys have any ideas or requests on what tutorials you would like to see in the future, uh, leave them down in the comments below and I will be sure to look at them and uh, possibly make it. I do want to do a more intermediate and advanced uh, C Sharp uh, tutorial section and I'd be interested in hearing what you guys uh, want to see in that and I would, I think I'm going to do a how to make a Twitch extension uh, video sometime in the future and how to make a Unity game, like a basic Unity game because Unity is the main engine you would want to use if you're making a game because it's free and it's good. Uh, there's also Unreal Engine, but uh, I'm not too familiar with Unreal Engine. I know Unity, uh, but thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a nice day.